they, they're going to uh, leave the museum with an, uh, another idea of their power as women and in science. So I hope you have a great day. Thank you all. Jeremy. Good morning. Um, it is a great pleasure for IANUS, which is a network of academies of science throughout the Americas to be involved in this. Women in Science has been a major program of IANUS since its foundation over um, ten, 10 years ago. And it is extremely important. You're all looking at a very old gray-haired man and it is about time that this changed. And it is really wonderful today to hear from the young women and how they are getting involved in science. It is absolutely essential. Science doesn't recognize gender. Unfortunately, scientists do incorrectly most often. So welcome, and this is a most important thing. And I would like at this point also to thank not only our hosts here, but also the Academy, um, the Brazilian Academy, who has been very active in organizing this. Good luck today, and good luck in your careers. And Ecuador, we're going to listen to all of them, and then we're going to have time to ask questions, OK? So let's get started. And the first speaker is Vania Wendy Torres from Bolivia, Universidad Mayor de San Andres. Please, Vania. Okay, hello, good morning everybody. So as they said, I'm from Bolivia. And I'm very thankful to everybody, and especially the, to, to us, Ianas, and everybody that make and made this possible, yeah, and that invited us. So I'm very, very excited about this, to present what is going on in Bolivia. So once we got the invitation with Monica, we got excited and we said, oh, what are we going to do? Because we have information, but uh, we don't have the, let's say, the actual information. So we said, OK, we are researchers, so what should we do? And we decided to do a survey. So <laughs> we designed a survey composed by 10 questions. We got emails from a lot of ladies, like 200, and we sent the survey through email to all of them. We got answers from them from 7 to 2, one, the ones that answered. And I'm going to present you the data from them, yes? So as a, an introduction, I would like to say that worldwide, only 30% of the researchers are women. Yes, and this is also something that happens in Bolivia. The next one, as a background, I would like to say that equity of opportunities is fundamental for us as a right. And then in Bolivia, I should say that we are still in this patriarchal system. <laughs> so let me show you m my sample. So as I said, we had the answers of 72 ladies. I am a biologist, so you can see the bias over here. I got answers from 60% of them because they are my friends, and I was visiting them and pushing them, please <laughs> answer. I know that you are busy, but please help me because I want to show all this information. But I should say that also we had biochemistry, uh, social communication, ecologists, agronomists, environmental engineers, water resources, geographists, pediatricians, uh, veterinary psychologists, and chemistries. Yes? So uh, then we got the questions. So one of the questions was, when did they decide to study a scientific career? So we got different answers. 
most of them said that they decided during school, right? And also they said that they always wanted to do science. So what we see here is that we have a filter, yeah? We identified that the school can be a filter for these ladies and also home, right? What is going on in their families? The next one was if their family or their partners were supporting them during this decision, right? And most of them said, yes, that is great, right? And that is why they were scientifics, right? <coughs> but some of them said no. Yes, but even though that, even the, they were not supported, they continue with the idea, with the decision, right? But of course, there are other ones that were not supported and are not scientific today. Okay, then we have the next question is, and it is that if they, while studying, they perceived limitations due to their gender by the professors or by their classmates. And most of them said no, and we are happy with this, right? And 40% said yes, but, the que but some of them said no, but I will think that at that time I was young and I didn't pay attention to those things. Yes, they said, uh, you are a female, we have to do field work, you are not strong enough and probably you are not going to be able to carry on all the things that we have to do during field work. So that is what they say. We heard these things, but we didn't feel as discrimination. We felt it like it was normal. They were always saying those things. But now that we have information about this and that we put a name to this, it, that this is discrimination, we can now say, yes, we were discriminated. But most of them are still saying, yeah, we, we heard that, but we didn't realize that that was discrimination. But the other thing that I would like to say is also that they said, we are in careers that Mainly, we are women. So we didn't feel that discrimination because like the minorities over there are the, the guys. So we were happy to have them so, and they didn't feel bad with us. So the next, the next question was if they, when they were looking for work or fundings, they felt any discrimination or barriers or gender inequity. And they said yes. Not most of them, but they said yes. And they said, some of them said uh, yes, because they were asking us during the interviews if we were going to get pregnant soon, if we felt able to carry things, to do field work, if we were going to have families, if we had a partner, or what was going on in our lives, right? The next one was if while publishing they felt any gender discrimination, and we are happy to have this big no here, but I would like to go and specifically see what is going on here because we have to pay attention to that. And they said, we have some quotes here, and they said, my tutor told me that I should, that he should be the first author because even though I wrote it, he was the experienced one, right? And the other said, uh, my ideas were not considered, but the ideas of my male partners were considered. And something interesting, not for being female, but for being Latin, because sometimes we have to work with groups that are not just uh, from South America, but we have to go and work with other labs from the US or from Europe. And I will and I think that we have to also focus on this. What happens to us as Latins? And the other one, as I said before, it's probably close to this one. The first author has to be the professor, right? So what we have to do here is also to think about ethics, but also to teach the young scientists what should be done here, right? What are the 
authorship and co-authorship rules. The next one is, uh, did anyone, any women inspire you to pursue a scientific career? And most of them said yes. And also it was interesting that they said yes, but they say I would like to include my mother even though she's not a scientist. But my mother is strong, yes? And my mother taught me that I could do everything. And why not to be a scientist? The next one, the next question is, uh, why do we need to have a Women in Science Day? And they said, it is because we need to show our contributions, right? And not only to show, to say, ah, we did this and we do that, but also to have examples to follow, to be valuable, right? To have other girls to be motivated by our contributions and to acknowledge them and others say that. It shouldn't be a day for that. But I think that we should think about these other answers, right? <laughs> and probably we have to promote and to, to show that we have this day and to show other examples, not only, let's say, Marie Curie, yes? We have to show that we are still alive and that we are doing science, right? And the conclusions that we have from this short and really fast survey that we did in Bolivia, is that uh, there is a relevant scientific vocation since school. Then that we have a 23% uh, of the family environment that did not support the choice of being a scientist. And that we have to work on that, right? Because that is a filter. It is very favorable that 63% of the women during their university training period did not have a gender difficulties. But we must focus on the other percent that they did have problems and we have to improve their conditions. Then, as I said before, we need to work and we need to inform young scientists about this authorship and co-authoring rules. The next one is that it is a priority to reverse the reported pattern of discrimination for the, this 56% uh, of women who suffer from discrimination while looking for jobs or fundings. And the other 84 supported and believed that uh, it is necessary to have this Women in Science Day. And it is uh, important to show and to make it visible that we are doing some achievements as scientists. And that's it, thank you. I would like to thank the <laughs> World Academy of Science. I would like to thank the Brazilian Academy for having us. Of course, the Bolivian Academy to Monica. And then to all the women in Bolivia that helped me with their answers. Thank you. Patricia Sanka from Universidad Federal do Rio de Janeiro.
So good morning. Thank you, everybody. I would like to start thanking uh, Academy, Brazilian Academy of Science and IONAS for this invitation. It's a great pleasure to be here. And mainly, I would like to thank Twazla Crep that's giving me a lot of support. So I'm here because of them, and I would like to thank. So today, I will talk about some I will show you some data about Brazilian reality in, in terms of gender balance, but I will also talk about me and my experience, okay? So I will start introducing me. Unfortunately, I, I cannot say anymore that I'm a young scientist since now I, I'm 42 years old and technically for scientific reasons, when you, we reach 40 years, we pass to a different level. So, uh, all my, my history, it was done in uh, UFRG. I am a pharmacist and I did my, my master and my PhD in biological chemistry, all of them in UFRG. During my PhD, I was a substitute professor in the pharmacy school and then I ran a contest, a public contest, and I was hired as an associate professor in 2007. For multiple reasons, I was very lucky in this year uh, because we have a, a new arrangement in our department, and then we got a, a space to build the lab. And at the same time, I got a lot of grants, so I was able to buy for the rebuilding of my own lab. So 10 years ago, I opened my lab and I became a head of my own lab. Since then, uh, or since, since my, my graduation, uh, where I, I did my scientific initiation, that is the, what, what we call in, in here in, in Brazil the studies or the lab work that we do during uh, the period of our uh, bachelor. I was able to publish 41 papers. I supervised two postdocs, five PhD theses, 10 masters, and more than 12 undergraduate students. In 2016, I was nominated to a young affiliate, and at the same time, or at the same year, I was elected as co-chair of TIAM. Pay attention in this logo that was made by Pedro, uh, because you'll see this a lot, I, I, I think. And TIAM is a new network that is connecting was young affiliates and try to put, in the, put them together uh, and create collaborations, okay? So, this is my group and this is my husband, my main collaborator, and I'll talk about him later. And from all the things that I, I, I got during my life, this is my, this is the perfect thing that I did. So this is my boy, Luigi. He is a seven years old uh, boy. And this year, I got a second son that is cranio, or the brain, our uh, rabbit. <laughs> so now I will, I will really start to talk about what, what I came from or what I have to do. So I will show you some data about the Brazilian scenario in terms of gender equality. I know that you saw a lot of things yesterday, so I'll pass really, really fast for this. In 2007, uh, Elsevier 
uh, launched this study. They published this study about the gender uh, uh, balance in the, the research field. Well, this was a surprise for everybody and was um, published in different uh, newspapers because one thing um, takes the attention of everybody, everybody that Brazil was uh, shown as the leader, the global leader for gender equality in science. And according to Elsevier, we have some things to celebrate. The first thing that is that globally, we have 40% of women are authors of the papers that are being published. But in Brazilian case, this number, it will reach 49%, which means that we are in almost a gender parity. And in terms of, uh, based on this Elsevier study, we could share this first um, position in the, the rank with Portugal. But they say that it's not possible because at the same time, in this period from 2011, 2015, Brazilian women published almost 154 papers, but, but the Portuguese um, um, pairs, uh, the, the females in Portuguese, they published only 27,000 um, papers. So we cannot compare it this. Another thing that is very interesting and is, is, a, is a proud for us is that in, in terms of inventions, what we have is that the numbers, they were uh, increased too. So we have 19% of the inventions that are made by women. This number is much bigger than the 12% that we see for the global uh, in, in, in global uh, level, even if you compare with UK and European Union. I will pass through this very fast because I want to show our reality and discuss a little bit about it. So the proportion is almost the same, mainly uh, we have um, a, a small difference here in terms of uh, female numbers for master students, but in PhD we have almost the same for men and women. But again, just to remind you, uh, if we see, uh, if we look for the, the distribution of these women and men in the different areas, we'll see that we have a concentration of men in some areas and women in biologicals and healthy and arts uh, areas. Well, the thing seems to be nice for us, and it seems that we are going in a good way, in a good, in, in a good direction. But we have some difference that should be discussed. One of them I is that if we compare the international collaboration rate between men and women, we'll see that women correspond to 20%, but men, they are able to collaborate more than 25% or 25% of the men they collaborate internationally. And because of that, or because of this, we have this scenario, because the international mobility of the researchers, it's very low for women. Only 32% of the women are able to um, travel and do these connections abroad. One other thing is the number of citation of the articles, the papers published. So for women, the numbers are, are lower than the 0 0.95 that we see for men. And for sure, one of the worst thing for us is that we have uh, a ceiling glass that keep us in the basal levels and don't let us um, go to the, the very high positions when we are talking about uh, our career in vertically sense. To explain or to give examples about this 
if we look, I, I bring some numbers, uh, if we look the grants uh, that are, are granted by CNPQ, and especially the grant that we call productivity in research, we'll see that females represent only 35.5% uh, in 2015. But if we go to the highest levels in, in this same grant, we'll see that we have only 27 women and uh, 112 men. In BAS, for example, Brazilian Academy of Science, there are no women as president until now. And between the members, we have only 50% of women. And yesterday during our dinner, uh, Professor Davidovich said, okay, but between the young affiliates, you are 25%. Uh, say, woohoo, it's good, but we know that we have to, to do more, okay? And this is extremely dramatic because we are passing through a very, very difficult period, uh, economical and politically speaking, and because of this, we are having very, very huge uh, cuts in our investments. And these cuts, they are much bigger in when we are talking about uh, how much is invested in the research, uh, researchers, no, research conducted by women. So uh, the numbers are that we are receiving one fourth of the, the, no, the, the amount that men are receiving. And quickly yesterday, I, I look at my, my data and I was able to, to, to do the math, how much I got in grants from 2008 until 2015. And it was something uh, about $120,000. Uh, Today, my budget is zero. I don't have no money to continue my work. Luckily, people like me and the sellers, they are giving me the material to continue my research and I have to pay them one day, but I can continue doing my, my, my research just because I'm having help of the, the sellers. One more thing, one more dramatic thing is that one of the main grants that we have here in Rio de Janeiro is the fellow that we call a uh, scientist of our uh, state. I used to be a young scientist from our state, but now I have more than 40 years So Last year I have to ask for this, this new level and my application was denied. And what they said is, I was too associated uh, with my former um, supervisor. Okay, so I'll go back to my husband. My husband is also my former supervisor. And we work together. And he is my, my main collaborator. We do everything together. We conduct different labs, but we are always working together. So, it's difficult to separate this. And one thing that uh, FAPEAGE didn't pay attention is that our productivity, mine and his productivity, increased since we established this conjoint group. Since a case of sexism, I don't know, but I don't like this, this kind of discourse. To finish, I would like to say that the fact is, besides the numeric equality of men and women in Brazilian science, it's clear that we are still far from the equity in opportunities, and on top of, of all, in, in equity of the treatment by the society. This is my email, if you want to, to send me something. And once again, thank you very much. Very much, Patricia. Um, um, next.
Let's move on to the next speaker from Dominican Republic. She's Melissa Ingrid Silier from Universidad Iberoamericana. Good morning, buenos dias. I will do my presentation in English because it was the uh, it was requested to do in English or maybe in Spanish, <coughs> so you all understand. I'm Melissa Silier. I'm from Dominican Republic. I'm a lawyer. I work also in Universidad Iberoamericana. My investigations and as professor, I work in a particular area of law that is called antitrust and administrative law. And since we as lawyer tend to talk a lot, I will put my clock, so I will give my colleagues some opportunities. We were asked to talk about our personal life and personal experience. And since debating these two days and talking about with my young colleagues, I think that we got about a main conclusion. They asked us for to talk about an experience about discrimination, maybe gender bias, and some of us didn't have a particular experience to talk about. But then when we think about it, we thought and identify certain circumstances that for cultural or educational reasons, we seem as normal, and they were not normal. So my first thing is to thank IANAS, the Brazilian Academy of Science and the Dominican Academy of Science for this opportunity, because it allowed us not only to think and to or participate, but to change our thinking about some topics that we usually, day by day, we see it normal in our country or in our region, in some other countries of the region, because we think that it happens every day, so it should stay this day. And we as young leaders, we will be allowed to go back to our country and then start a new debate and start a new way of thinking. First of all, I would like to make a statement or maybe clarify that I know that we uh, as a co country from the same region, we have similar problems and similar difficulties in our uh, work or uh, investigation that we do. But I would like to point out that Dominican Republic as a small country, sometimes we as young uh, investigators, we have uh, these uh, main problems because and one, the first one is because we have to need to share our academic or scientist uh, investigations with other kind of professions. Or maybe we have to share, if we like an er a specific area of science, we have to share it to give class in other types of science or other types of careers or maybe go to a general career and talk about our main specialization. And this uh, not allows uh, young scientists to focus or to investigate in a particular area, do because it's not an incentive from the university or from the society in general to become a, a, a whole time uh, academy. And we have to share it with other types of works, informal works, or maybe other types of formal works in order to do what we actually love, that is to be do research and teach. There's also lack of finance support and to not only do the search on to, on to publicate. So one of the main problems in this in our country is brain drain. So there are certain times uh, uh, peer review journals that you can publish in our country, but they are not recognized in, in the region or maybe in the world. So what students actually do is when they go abroad to do their master LLM, in my case, or do their PhD, they stay in this country because they see an opportunity to focus on what they want. Now to my personal experience, and the main challenge that I have is, uh, I will talk in my particular case, is that my profession is a, a profession mainly dominated by men. I know that certain uh, scientists here, uh, the, the, the proportion is similar. But in my uh, case, what is happening is that law women lawyers are becoming, uh, are increasing the number every day, every year. But there are certain areas of law 
that they seem that women, for example, litigation or other areas or that are uh, only mainly by, by men. There's a lack of attempt to do local publications and there is like this uh, difference that we have been talking in the last, uh, yesterday we talked about the, the these are here studying with my colleagues and the women that increase and uh, still participate in their publishing and do more research, do other type of study. In my, in my undergraduate uh, class, we were mainly women, maybe 10, 15 percent were men. But then when I continue with my career, the women start to disappear. Maybe some of the factors we uh, debated to the, uh, yesterday, maternity, other reasons, but it's a problem that is present. And the main uh, problem that I, I, I have been experienced is what is called mansplaining. I don't know if you know the term. It is a new term that is uh, usually used in the last uh, years due to influence by the press of the uh, United States that is constantly using for the political situation. But mansplaining happens when you, as a woman, are trying to explain a concept, explain your position, and then goes a man and say, oh, well, it's like he tells you to shut up without telling to shut up because he pos his position is the one that it is right, that is the one that should be heard, and is the one that has some scientific or doctrine background. Yours is the worst, yours maybe you don't know because you're a woman. And then the men, during the debate, they, it's, it's not like he said it to shut up, but he tried to impose his position. One thing I would like to talk about from my perspective is, uh, and to debate, is that if the legal environment has some influence on what we are living. And discussing with uh, my scientists from other uh, countries, I identify that it has. For example, let's, let's talk about the labor code in our country, in particular mater uh, mater maternity leave and paternity leave. I am married, but I don't have a, a children yet. But when we compare what the labor code in our country says about maternity leave, you see that we as a woman has achieved a good time of, of amount to be to, of maternity leave. It, ha it has increased from three months to four months. But then, when you see paternity leave, uh, men only have one day. One day to be out of their office to take care of a child, a newborn child. When you see uh, the labor code about a uh, time after marry, men have five days to honeymoon. So they have more time to go away for honeymoon than to take care of their boy. For, uh, currently, our country is in the debate about a modification on the labor code, but this is not a topic that is even in consideration. And I think that it only affects me it offends everyone because yesterday we debated a lot about how our personal life has influenced in our professional life. And that's how I think the legal environment of each of our countries have a special influence. I also find other types of discriminatory rules. I, I won't talk about it a lot because I find a lot, but I think that in each of our country, and it's a thing that we should and think about it. There are certain discriminatory rules that affect our personal life and somehow affect our professional life. Our constitution says that women and men are equal. But then when you go to the particular law, it's not, uh, it has not adequate to the constitution. So these undiscriminatory dispositions. And finally, and something that we talk about in the first state, it's about quotas as a way to solve certain problems. Quotas rules uh, works, and I think they're present in your country, is to, uh, to keep certain per, uh, percentage of spaces for women in political place. I think that quotas are good, but they have failed in certain way in their application. For example, in our country, there is a, um, a law that express 
quota for women in political charges, of political places. And 33% should be for women in the Dominican Republic. But what is happening in the practice, and I was talking to my friends yesterday, is that a man that is a political put his wife in the position to achieve the quota, and then in the day day, he's actually the political that is taking the decision, taking the money, and doing everything. The woman is just a fake political in the place to fill the quota. I think it's a long path, but we are walking towards the right direction. I am in favor of special recognition. Uh, we debated yesterday about if women should have special prizes uh, in their professions. I'm in favor of that. I'm in favor that we have, in this one we have in law, they're called chambers. But I don't think that it should be perpetual. Right now, there is a big gap and we should acknowledge the work of women that they do an extra work to be uh, the number one in their profession. But in certain points, we will have to question if it is acceptable to have this different type of recognition from the woman. Because what we want to do is to achieve an equal uh, statement of wo both of us. And this type of recognition, I think it is good right now, but in certain time, we have to question about it. I, in favor of actually promote the role of a woman, I think this type of events, as I explained in the introduction, is a part of it. And I think we should put short-term goals. Awareness about our profession and we as a female has been debated in the last decade in my country. But I think we are lack of short-term goals of what we want in our profession and to recognize our rights as a scientist, woman scientist. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Melissa. <coughs> and now we mo move on to the last uh, presentation of this session. She's from Ecuador, Valeria Ochoa, from Universidad San Francisco de Quito. And after that, remember, we're going to have the, the questions. So thank you, good morning, buenos dias. Um, since my colleague spoke English, I'm continuing English as well. So thanks a lot for the invitation. I would like to thank especially Marcia and Patricia for having us here in Rio de Janeiro and, and being part of this great meeting. So I'm gonna tell you, I'm gonna start uh, telling you who I am. So I got my PhD in environmental engineering at the University of Arizona. I also have a master's in in environmental engineering, a master's in analytical chemistry, uh, chemistry at the same university, and I'm a chemical engineer, and I come from Universidad San Francisco de Quito, which is in Ecuador. And currently, I am working at the same university. I work at the Department of Environmental Engineering. I am department head. Uh, I also uh, coordinate, uh, I am the director of the first water quality laboratory in the Galapagos Island. So we have a research station in San Cristobal together with UNC Chapel Hill. And I have the first lab, as I said before. I'm the technical coordinator of the Office of Innovation and Sustainability, and I'm committed to convert USFQ, my university, in a sustainable campus in Latin America. Also, um, I was honored to receive, um, at the beginning of this year, I was appointed adjunct professor at UNC Chapel Hill in the environmental uh, science and engineering department. And one, I am one of the co-founders of the WISE initiative at Universidad San Francisco de Quito, and I'm gonna be talking about this during my, my, pre my next slides. So my areas of research, I am an environmental engineer, as I mentioned before, so I do work on fresh water quality. I work on bio remediation of domestic and industrial effluents. I mainly work with bacteria and microalgae. I work on biofuels, biodiesel, and biogas. 
and I'm very interested on understanding the impacts of metals in the environmental matrix. And on top of all of this, I do sustainability. So I thought it was a good idea to, short, uh, to share a picture um, of me during my field work. So this is in the Galapagos Island. As you know, the Galapagos belong to Ecuador, so we're very fortunate to go there. And I have two project, research projects. So here we are working in, the, in Isabela, and this is my colleague, Andrea. I don't know why did this is not working. Anyway, so Andrea, and I'm, I'm going to be talking about her later on, so that's why I'm pointing. Uh, so you can see who Andrea is. So what we're doing here is we're trying to um, establish or and we're analyzing of the aquatic systems because in the Galapagos there is um, there is no a lot of fresh water. There is just a little bit in one island. So we're analyzing and determining how the situation of fresh water is in the Galapagos Islands. So I would like to start with uh, statistics. I am an engineer, so I like numbers. So I will. I was doing some research and I found out this graph, which I believe is very interesting. And you can see the women that are doing science in Latin America. So this data is from uh, the United Nations. Uh, and you can see like, actually Bolivia is the country that has more women in science than the others. So about like 60%. On the other extreme, you can see Honduras, where you have lower than 30%. And in the case of Ecuador, we are about 40% women doing research. This data, although this data looks really nice, as uh, my previous colleague already mentioned, there are uh, still a lot of things we need to work on. If we compare this to the rest of the world, we see like around in the world, we have 30% women doing research. In Latin America, in average, is 45% higher to what's happening in North America and Western Europe. And for instance, in places like Germany and France, you have 30% women doing research. Again, this looks nice, we, but we still have a lot of things to do. So I'm going to talk about USFQ. This is a liberal arts school where all areas of knowledge are equally important. And I'm going to present some data. So in our case, we have 30% of women in the academia. And this is very important to say that this is mainly the case in Ecuador. For our uh, students, although we have 50% male and 50% female students in the university, you can see some difference based on the faculties or college. For instance, I'm going to focus on the college where I work, of the faculty where I work, which is Polytechnico, a School of Science and Engineering. And here you can see we only have 30% of the students are female. And if we talk about professors, we only have 10% of professors are female. In other areas, you see more women, but also I would like to point out what happens in the School of Music. Less than 20% are women, because typically, on, and we're not talking about, we're talking about science here, but I would just like, to think, like you to think about that. You have never heard about a good guitarist, a good drumist, you only hear about good singers. So they call the boys club because it's only, women are only in music for singing, you know? That's one thing that we should think about in terms of academia. Okay, so I would like to show more statistics, recent ones. This was published in April. So women are less successful when applying for patents. For instance, in the US, between 2001 and 2014, they received like 2.7 million patents and less 21% um, less likely to be accepted for women, and that dropped to 7% when you take into consideration technology. So one thing we could be doing, maybe be blind the pro application process so it's more fair. I don't know, that's a question. Women are underrepresented at conferences. For instance, you know the famous AGU, American Geophysical Union meeting. So uh, this study was published in April as well of this year. You see that from 22,000 applications, only 30% of them are for female talks, and only 7% are invited speakers, uh, female invited speakers. So what things could, can we do about it? Can we do something about it? We could encourage more women to apply, and or we could have gender equity in the selection committee. That might help as well. I don't know. So this is a topic that we're all talking about, so nature just uh, start with two awards, Inspiring Science Award and Innovation Science Award for Women, in collaboration with Steel Lauder. The awards haven't uh, been awarded yet, they will be awarded by the end of the year. 
So what can we do? So I'm going to tell you what we're doing in two specific topics, which is we need to increase the numbers and we need to have better conditions for women. So I'm going to talk about the initiative we created at USFQ that was created in 2015. So our objective is to promote and increase women representation in STEM in, Equ in, STEM in Ecuador. So these are, we here, he, we, here we have the, the the ones that created this initiative, and I would like to share a small video with you so you know what this initiative is about. Hola, mi nombre es Valeria Ochoa. Yo soy la coordinadora de Ingeniería Ambiental y cofundadora de WISE. WISE, Mujeres en Ciencias e Ingeniería, es una iniciativa de la Universidad San Francisco de Quito que creamos hace tres años con el objetivo de promover la presencia de la mujer ecuatoriana en carreras de ciencias e ingeniería. Dentro de la iniciativa WISE USFQ, hacemos foros, hacemos conversatorios, invitamos a destacadas científicas, tanto a nivel nacional e internacional, a que vengan, a que compartan con nosotros la ciencia que ellas están realizando, todas sus contribuciones al mundo científico y que nos cuenten lo que ha sido su vida en este campo de ciencias e ingeniería. Les invitamos a participar, les invitamos a que vengan, que atiendan a nuestros foros para que sepan lo que nosotros estamos trabajando y de esta manera juntos promovamos la presencia de más mujeres en estos campos. Soy María del Carmen Cazorla, soy PhD en Meteorología y dirijo la Estación de Mediciones Atmosféricas de la Universidad San Francisco de Quito. La beca WISE significa Women in Science and Engineering y es una beca promovida por nuestra iniciativa de Mujeres en Ciencia e Ingeniería de la Universidad. Este es un esfuerzo significativo de la Universidad San Francisco de Quito por promover la presencia en mayor número de jóvenes mujeres en carreras de ciencia, ingeniería y tecnológicas. Queremos invitarte a que participes, a que concurses y si tienes condiciones académicas excepcionales este es el lugar para ti. I'm sorry about that. Okay, so as you heard, we have a WISE a scholarship. So this is 100% tuition coverage at USFQ. USFQ is a private university, and we are very happy because we awarded the first WISE scholarship on May of this year. So as we speak, we have the first WISE a person that got this scholarship and she's going to study physics and her name is Valeria, the same as mine. So since we've been talking about this initiative, some people, some colleagues came to us and asked, we really like your WISE initiative and we'd like to be part of it, but we are lawyers, we are economists, we are artists. So we thought it was a good moment to create and we have this forum which was for opportunities and challenges for women in the academia. And also, in February of 2017, it was formed the first WISE initiative in the country, which is Red Ecuatoriana de Mujeres Científicas in Ecuador. And they are very active. For instance, this June, they have uh, the first international conference about the impact of women in science. And there is also two chapters, and one of them is at the University of Cuenca in the southern part of Ecuador. So we are very happy and very humble at the same time because we see our WISE initiative is being an example for other universities and our dream is that all Ecuadorian universities will have something like WISE. And I was working about to have better working conditions, so we, thanks to our WISE initiative, now we have a lactation room at the university. I don't know how it is in your universities, but in Ecuador there is no lactation rooms. There is no lactation rooms even at some uh, companies or even shopping malls. So we have this place which is dedicated for women so women can have their children and they can work at the same time. So this is very we're very happy about this and this was recognized by the Ministry of Health in Ecuador. 
So just to finish, um, I believe there are some things we could be doing. So I turned 40 yesterday, last night, you know, we were singing happy birthday. So I'm not young anymore, as Patricia said, but I think I would like to share things that I've been doing during my career that have been very helpful. So I guess it's very important for all of us to find a niche, to find something that unique, something that is exciting so we, we can do our science. I believe we need to have good people. Good science is done by talented people, so we need to find that people, we need to find that good people. It's very important to work together. I think instead of competing against each other, we should get together, we should have joint applications that will be very good because we can collaborate and work more. We need to build our network. That's one thing we're already doing here. We need to have our network. We need to be our own marketing department. We need to be in social media. We need to be there so people know who we are. And finally, I believe mentoring is very important. And we need to go to senior scientists. We need to ask for help. We need to ask for advice. We always, sometimes we just need to have a cup of coffee and that's good and we should be doing that. Final thoughts, I think we need to be more vocal. We need to talk about these topics. We need to have these type of meetings. I believe it's also important to raise our voice. I have never felt discriminated, but two months ago, I was told by a male colleague what to do because I am a woman. So I, I slept on it. Two days after, I replied saying, you know what, this is not okay. We are colleagues and I kindly ask you to respect me because I respect you. So I think it's very important to stop this kind of things and say, you know, this is not okay. We need to create a community. We need to encourage and support each other. That's very good. Sometimes women, we are more hard or we criticize more to our female partners than male do. So that's very important to keep in mind. We are, we are one. So we need more women in top positions. I'm definitely convinced that that's one thing to go and one thing we should be uh, looking for. We need to incorporate our male peers. I think this is a strategic because we need to talk to them. We need to, to talk to them, to have them in the same table and tell them, you know what, this is not okay. So we need to start, we need to collaborate and do more things together. And I believe role models are really, really important in our lives. And I would like to talk about my first role model, which is my former supervisor, my PhD advisor. She says that she's not my supervisor anymore, but I will always call her my advisor. Her name is Reyes at the University of Arizona. And Laurence Maurice, Laurence is a French uh, scientist. She's in Ecuador and we've been working together for three years and she's a really a nice lady. And my best friend, my colleague, my collaborator, Andrea, the one that I show in the picture that we were together in the Galapagos. So to have this type of woman in my life, mm -hmm. it has made such a significant change and a difference. And I encourage all of you to have and find role models. And I would like to finish my talk with this African proverb which, which says, if you want to go fast, go alone. But if you want to go far, go together. And I think that's one thing we should be doing. We should get together, we, we need to work together, work together, we need to talk more between us. And thank you very much. Uh, stay there, Valeria, because I, I want to ask, invite the speakers to move here and start the, the questions. We have 10 minutes, so the session is open to discussion. If you have a question, yes. Muchas gracias por las presentaciones, estuvieron muy interesantes. Eh, pienso que hay muchos temas comunes entre nosotras. Yo me sentí muy identificada con varias de las cosas que mencionaron. Eh, por ejemplo, lo de, lo, lo de no, no aceptar que el trabajo mío sea ahora mío y pensar que sigue siendo el supervisor. Entonces yo llegaba a la vicerrectoría de investigación y me decían, ah, no, ese es el proyecto de Pedro, <risa> ¿verdad? Y entonces siempre queda ese sesgo de que no es un proyecto propio. Eh, yo, yo tengo una duda 
que he estado pensando sobre el Día Internacional de la Mujer y la Niña en la Ciencia, que, que, que se hace también en Costa Rica, y, y es un tema que he comentado con otras mujeres en ciencia que me produce, no, no estoy segura de, de la utilidad, entonces lo que yo a veces siento es que al haber un día especial, hace como si fuéramos la excepcionalidad y en la Academia de Ciencias de Costa Rica lo que yo he insistido es que en las conferencias que se dan, que antes eran 12 conferencias durante los 12 meses del año dadas por hombres, porque la excusa era que no habían mujeres que dijeran que sí, pero eso no es cierto porque yo llevé una lista de 18 mujeres que me aceptaron para el año entrante. Entonces, este año, el 2018, fueron siete mujeres y cinco hombres en las conferencias del mes. Lo otro que hicimos en Costa Rica es un grupo parecido a WISE, que hay una base de datos y yo la repartí a todos los periodistas. Y entonces, cuando hay una noticia que debe ser comentada por periodismo científico, la que da la opinión, eh, así con, con ayuda de periodistas mujeres que creen en lo mismo, la que da la opinión experta es una científica mujer. Y entonces, es esa 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 incomodidad mía con el Día de la Mujer, ¿verdad? Como si fuéramos excepcionales y más bien tratar de movernos a que somos de todos los días, a que damos conferencias todos los días, a que estamos en los medios todos los días en lugar del de Día de la Mujer y la Niña en la Ciencia. No sé qué opinan. I would like to answer. Should I do it in English or in Spanish? Okay. So let me do it in Spanish because you already heard me in English. <laughs> Entonces, eh, yo estoy totalmente de acuerdo contigo. Yo creo que de alguna manera sí es como que, igual con lo del Día de la Mujer, que seguimos con eso, ¿no es cierto? Igual con esto del Día de la Mujer en la Ciencia, pero yo me pongo a pensar y tal vez es posible que lo tenemos que ver desde otro punto y no pensar en que, ah, es el Día de la Mujer de la Ciencia, entonces yo me doy feriado y me quedo en la casa, no sé. ¿Sí? Más bien deberíamos pensar desde el punto de que es para promover, ¿ves? Nosotros necesitamos ser héroes de alguien, ¿sí? Porque los niños a veces necesitan eso, que si yo tienen al Superman y todos los niños quieren Superman, o todos los niños quieren ser Spider-Man, pero ¿por qué no ser? Entonces, eso es lo que necesitamos nosotros, no que sea para nosotros, sino más bien que nosotros podamos ser los héroes de otras chicas, de otras niñas, ¿sí? Yo más bien estoy en pro de eso, solo desde ese punto, no desde el punto de, ah, si somos minoría y seguimos siendo minoría, sino más bien de promover, de hacer visible, de que sí, es, de que sí existimos. Muchas gracias, fue muy interesante escucharlas, conocerlas, los distintos puntos de vista. Tengo, una pre tengo dos preguntas, una para la, la, la muchacha de, de Bolivia y es, de dónde sacó su muestra, o sea, cuál era su universo, cuál era su muestra, no me quedó, esa parte no me quedó muy clara, entonces no sé si, se puede, si es generalizable, no sé si no es generalizable, esa es una. Y la otra es para la colega de Brasil, que eh, me pareció que fue, ayer algo se dijo, pero nos quedamos un poquito sin saber exactamente el tema presupuestario, es decir, sabemos que, no sabemos, yo no sé, yo, confieso en mi ignorancia, no sé si es que no hay una política de promoción de la investigación científica o si la hay y se de pronto se suspendió, es decir, quizás mi ignorancia del medio es lo que me, me... Pero algo mencionaste de que tus fondos se acabaron y no sé exactamente si es una política nacional al respecto o si es en tu único caso, no sé. Entonces, eso, y a las otras colegas, pues, muy lindas sus presentaciones. Muchas gracias por darnos a conocer tanta información. Yes, uh, my, well, we got emails from a lot of women that were already linked to the Bolivian Academy of Science. So that is why we had a lot of different uh, ladies from different careers. 
But also I asked my friends if they have other friends in other careers that they were also doing science. So they gave me emails. Uh, so in that way I got like uh, 200 emails of women in science. And that is why I sent them and I just got answers of 72 ladies. So uh, the numbers that I, I, I show, they are national numbers, mm -hmm. so it's not for me. This cutting in, in the uh, financial support is for everybody. What we have is that since 2015, uh, the investment in science is diminishing, and now it's almost nothing. And we have more than 40% of the investments being cut in almost every year. Uh, for us here in Rio de Janeiro, we have a, a, a special situation because our state is also in, in, in crisis, in financial crisis. So who was keeping us uh, or maintaining us with money was Vapergi, but now they don't have, um, they don't have money to, to do this. So we have uh, grants that were approved in 2014 and they weren't paid until now. So if they pay the money that they should do, we will have uh, a way to, to continue do even during this crisis, but <coughs> they are not paying. So this is the main point. Now the only grant that we have in, th in the lab is the, the, this grant that I, I applied last year, and this year I applied again, and uh, that is 2,050, I don't remember, uh, 2.5 uh, thousand reais, which means $400 per, per month. This is what we have um, monthly to, to maintain our research. And that's because my husband got his, his grant. So this is the situation, and it's for all, not just for me. Yo tenía un comentario y una reflexión, más bien que una pregunta. Con respecto a la situación económica argentina, atraviesa exactamente lo mismo. Estamos financiando de nuestros propios bolsillos la investigación. Pero yo comentaba hoy que hice, eh, como tengo muchos más años que ustedes, este, atravesé varias crisis económicas y eh, comentaba que la carrera, la producción científica de la mujer comparada con la del hombre, la del hombre es estable y de las mujeres tiene una caída después del nacimiento de cada hijo o cuando hay un problema de cuidado de los padres. Sin embargo, en los años de crisis económicas, todas caen igualmente y eh, se hace mucho más daño a la producción de la ciencia, estas interrupciones en, la fin en el financiamiento de la investigación que el género. Digo, la maternidad nos recuperamos y después tenemos una producción que corta la línea de los hombres y sigue creciendo. Eh, las mujeres somos fuertes y, este, y podemos atender todas las cosas. Las crisis económicas provocadas por los gobiernos y los manejos, eso es, eh, provoca un daño mucho más largo y afecta a todos por igual. El otro comentario que tenía, más bien es una pregunta que, ten, que me hago y que pongo en la mesa. Los, eh, los auspicios, los premios notables para mujeres en ciencia a nivel mundial han sido L'Oreal y ahora Estelle Oder. Me inquieta un poco que seamos objetos de cosmética y digo, no tengo una respuesta porque cuando vi eh, la ilustración de tuya, Vania, la primera, que está la mujercita subiendo la escalera, eh, pero dejó los tacos altos abajo. No quiero dejar los tacos altos mientras hago investigación, quiero seguir siendo femenina y científica pero a la vez me molesta y no sé, digo, lo pongo como reflexión, que los fondos que auspician premios importantes y reconocimientos 
nos ponen como ejemplo, pero para la cosmética. Y cuando uno camina por las calles de París y ve las hermosas fotos, vi de la colega astrónoma brasileña Thaisa Starchi, que ganó el premio L'Oreal, o la colega argentina bióloga, pero es la propaganda de L'Oreal. Eh, no, no estoy poniendo una respuesta, simplemente a ver si para reflexionar y de qué otra manera podríamos conseguir auspicios que no sean de la industria de la cosmética. No, UNESCO, perdón, pero UNESCO fue eh, asociado a L'Oreal para actuar en la selección y decidir qué este, institu instituciones académicas en cada país, pero el premio es L'Oreal. Sí, bueno, sigo en español. And then we go for the coffee break and come back 10 minutes later to no, hear more, ¿ok? Muy breve, muy breve. Eh, gracias por las excelentes presentaciones y por las vidas de ustedes. Eh, además, lo que nos aportan y lo que aprendemos de ustedes. Eh, a mí me gustaría saber eh, qué vínculos... Eh, o, o escuchar algo acerca de los vínculos de ustedes con sus respectivas academias de ciencias. ¿Cómo ustedes eh, eh, tienen posibilidades de interactuar con las academias de ciencias y eh, algunas experiencias que puedan tener? Porque me parece que junto con las universidades, las respectivas academias de ciencias eh, tienen una responsabilidad grande con la formación de las jóvenes generaciones de científicos, con eh, apoyarlas de diferentes formas e incluso buscar fórmulas para que se asocien con algún tipo de membresía a las academias, porque hay que renovar las membresías de las academias que eh, necesitan de esa sangre joven y de mentalidades incluso que ayudan a un desarrollo mayor de la ciencia. Y me gustaría escuchar algunos comentarios. Gracias. Con respecto a la Academia de Ciencias del Ecuador, es una academia joven que se fue formada hace pocos años, entonces en principio hay predominancia de colegas hombres en esta academia, pero eh, la idea es que a futuro tengamos más mujeres y que más mujeres jóvenes se incorporen. Entonces sí hay una, una mensualidad, hay una fía anual que se tiene que cancelar y eso es lo que actualmente le está deteniendo a mucha gente, ¿no? porque qué tan valioso es hacer este pago y qué es lo que estamos recibiendo como academia. Pero sin embargo, tengo que decir que en el caso particular de la Academia de Ciencias del Ecuador, eh, teníamos una presidenta mujer hasta hace el año pasado y actualmente tenemos un presidente hombre. Entonces, una de las ideas de la academia es que eh, la directiva es mitad mujer y mitad hombre, entonces vamos a tener presidenta mujer, hombre, mujer, hombre, para que se vayan intercalando y tengamos un poco más presencia femenina. Y la participación de los jóvenes. No solo en la participación de los jóvenes, eh, hoy por hoy es primordialmente senior scientists. Tenemos pocos eh, científicos jóvenes y eso es algo que la academia quiere trabajar, quiere atraer mentes jóvenes para poder crecer. Y creo que es un buen momento porque es una academia joven, es una academia nueva, entonces está en la oportunidad de, de aprender de los colegas de otros países y ver cómo podemos seguir en esa dirección. Bueno, eh, la Academia de la República Dominicana ya tiene un tiempo considerable. Si uno ve la foto de los miembros fundadores, ve que en la mayoría fueron jóvenes, fueron hombres, perdón. Pero uno ve que a través de los años este punto de vista ha cambiado. La participación de la mujer en diferentes comités, en sus publicaciones, en sus actividades, ve que de cierta forma tienen un interés en dar apertura, no solamente a los hombres científicos, sino también a las mujeres científicas. Respecto de los jóvenes, ya la dirección de la academia es 
básicamente, me imagino que la mayoría de la región, de científicos seniors, o sea, personas con ya más experiencia, tienen su carrera profesional, sus publicaciones, ciertos parámetros. Pero esto no da cabida a que los jóvenes no tengamos oportunidad de participar en ciertas, algunas de las actividades que ellos están realizando. O sea, que entiendo que la tendencia es buena, lo que nosotros como jóvenes de, y mujer joven debemos de garantizar que no sea una tendencia que se mantenga hasta cierto punto, sino que sea una tendencia que como pasa en todo lo que hemos discutido hoy en día, se mantenga en los altos rangos, en los altos comités. We can keep on the discussion and the exchange of ideas during the coffee break. And let's give a big applause to the, all the speakers this morning. We come back 10. Okay. Short coffee break.
and know and learn about the experience in other country. But let me please let my presentation in Spanish. <laughs> Quiero presentarles mi caso como algo. Ok, ok. Ok. Quiero presentarles eh, un poco de mi experiencia como investigadora. Eh, sin embargo, eh, probablemente no sea la misma de, de otras chicas de mi país. Eh, para comenzar, quiero explicarles dónde queda El Salvador. Somos un país bien pequeño de apenas 21 mil kilómetros cuadrados y eh, nuestros vecinos pues, son Guatemala, Honduras y Nicaragua. Eh, la población, sí, predominamos las mujeres en un 52% y en el caso de educación superior, eh, aparentemente también somos eh, más las que nos inscribimos en las universidades. Sin embargo, cuando hacemos un Zoom a ciertas áreas o ciertos temas, como es el caso de la ciencia, tecnología y medio ambiente, eh, nos damos cuenta de una gran diferencia entre mujeres y hombres, porque eh, no llegamos ni siquiera al 40% en matricularnos en estos temas. Y más difícil aún es el empleo, ya que nuestros empleos principalmente tienen que ver con el comercio, con el servicio, eh, y allí es donde predomina la mujer en un casi 20%. Pero en la educación solo llegamos apenas al 2.1% de representación de la mujer. 1986, perdón que se me desconfiguró un poco la diapositiva, pero 1986 es un año crítico para nuestro país, principalmente porque llevábamos seis años de guerra civil, en la que niños, niñas, pues, eh, se les violentaron sus derechos y asimismo infraestructura como puentes, edificios, fueron dañados severamente. Ese mismo año tuvimos un terremoto devastador que terminó con edificaciones privadas y públicas. Bueno, en este año nací yo. Y desde mi juventud, desde mi niñez, escuché muchas palabras en mi alrededor. Palabras de que éramos la siguiente generación, éramos la generación de paz. En el año que yo nací, teníamos seis años de guerra y faltaban seis años más para terminar el conflicto armado. Es decir, todo es, toda la, la visión estaba puesta en esta niñez que venía ya de la paz, que venía a reconstruir un país dañado. Sin embargo, eh, fue ahí donde nació mi deseo de ser ingeniera. Yo dije, tengo que ayudar a construir mi país. Sin embargo, mis padres mi familia, mi entorno, me decían que no, porque esa era una carrera de hombre, que yo tenía que hacer cosas de mujer. Y es así, la ingeniería civil es una carrera masculinizada. Yo tenía eh, 50 compañeros de mi generación y solo tres éramos mujeres, el resto eran hombres. No solamente eso, en toda mi carrera, Tuve más de 50 profesores hombres y solo dos profesoras mujeres. En mi, en mi maestría fue igual. Tuve una, una sola profesora en Japón, que era la, la, la profesora que más me encantó, pero ella era americana, ella era estadounidense. Nunca tuve una profesora japonesa. Es decir, nunca vi ni siquiera el rol de una mujer que realmente la dejaran ser líder, la dejaran promover esa participación entre nosotras, las mujeres. Por otro lado, tengo compañeras que aunque sí eh, tienen alguna representación en la carrera, no llegamos a posiciones elevadas. En mi trabajo, pues, yo estoy rodeada de hombres al igual. Mi jefe es hombre y... Hasta la fecha solo he tenido una jefa. 
que ella es colombiana, ni siquiera del país. Eh, por eso, algunos desafíos que se encuentran en mi país es cómo incrementar esta participación de las mujeres en estos temas. Yo creo que unas buenas oportunidades son a partir de la influencia que pueda generar la academia en las nuevas generaciones. Y también, por supuesto, conocer las experiencias de nuestras generaciones anteriores, que esto lo, lo va a hacer muy importante. Mi trabajo actual, pues, quiero comentarles que la academia en general no está muy activada en mi país, la investigación no es muy fuerte. Sin embargo, eh, mi deseo de hacerlo hizo que luego de volver mi, de mi maestría, yo buscara la universidad para, pues, trabajar, pero pasé muchas dificultades económicas, las que me hicieron abandonar el tiempo completo y mejor irme a mi trabajo como ingeniera en planificación y es la que trabajo de digamos de 8 de la mañana a 4 de la tarde. De 5 en adelante, 4 horas todos los días, se las dedico a la investigación en la universidad. Por ejemplo, llevo hasta esta fecha que no me han pagado este año. Yo subsisto gracias a mi trabajo, digamos, primero. Pero mi deseo de investigar es tal que no me importa. Por eso soy pues soltera y sí ayudo a mis padres, obviamente pero quiero quedarme así. <risa> eh, conduzco eh, investigaciones aplicadas, eh, soy supervisora de trabajo de, de pregraduación, eh, también he conseguido proyectos para la universidad y coordinado algunos proyectos con mis estudiantes. En todos he pedido que sea eh, en la misma representación de mujeres y hombres de los estudiantes. He tenido quejas de, mis, de los estudiantes hombres en los que me dicen no es justo porque las mujeres son menos acá y por qué les permite estar más acá. <ríe> y les digo, bueno, todos vivimos en un mundo de injusticia. <ríe> Muchas gracias y solo quiero decirles que a pesar de todas las dificultades, soy la primera ingeniera de mi familia. <ríe> Muchas gracias, Ingrid. Ahora seguimos. We now follow with Marlene Susana Arrechea Alvarado eh, from the Universidad de San Carlos en Guatemala. Buenos días a todos. Good morning to everyone. Uh, before starting, I want to ask you what do you prefer, English or Spanish? I, I'm indifferent. Okay. So for respect to those that doesn't speak Spanish, I will speak in English. Um, I am from Guatemala. I am researcher at the University of San Carlos of Guatemala. I have the same problem that my friend from El Salvador. We, I hadn't get any payment from this year. And I am a member of the uh, Science uh, Academy in Guatemala. Um, this year I have been involved in many uh, equity gender in science activities. Uh, thanks to different uh, institutions that now are doing more of this uh, promotion in Guatemala. First, um, the Secretary of National Science in Guatemala uh, promote some fest, STEAM fest in rural communities. So we visit uh, some rural schools and we do little groups of 25 girls with uh, one scientist and they invite like 10 or 12 scientists and they do different rounds. So this uh, is almost uh, potential 500 for each activity, and they have developed uh, five of these activities during this year. Another activity that is uh, mainly every year is uh, Microsoft Digi Girls. 
they do it in uh, different countries and they uh, started to do it uh, five years ago in Guatemala. So this program uh, gets uh, one day together with high school girls to motivate them to study science. Then uh, another uh, activity is uh, the first young meeting in science uh, made by uh, SENACIT, by the Secretary of National Science uh, this year during one big congress named Conversciencia that bring together all the Guatemalan research scientists that are around the world working in different places or inside the country and they put them together and we organized this activity of one day with the with the people with around 1,600 girls. And uh, I have been tutoring some young women in undergraduate in the university. And I am, do I am directing a group of uh, research, volunteer research, I call it. It has 80% of women and they, they, get, uh, they want to know more advice about how to write a publication, how to start a poster, how to study uh, in a foreign country, uh, what should I do if I want to be a scientist, what should I do if I want to do research. So um, we are trying to do this, these activities. Another um, important thing is the Metropolitan Network of Women in Science that is uh, now conducted by Senacid, but it was originated by the president of the Academy of Science who was promoting this network. And another of our fraud is that she's a woman, Car Carmen is here, and is, uh, is a good representation. So uh, I have been collaborated as woman scientist in USAC uh, with uh, about uh, 3,500 girls uh, in the topic of STEAM. In during this year, so it's one of the activities and it's very, very excited. But these activities bring us more reflection because uh, talking to the girls, I have been discovering so many comments that just inspire me to fight more for this. For this. So here, uh, a girl of 13 years old, uh, she dreamed to study mechanic, but her dad told her that career is only for men. And this is this year, it's 2018, and these th things are not things of the past. This, keep, uh, this is a part of our day, day by day. And then another girl of 12 years old told me, I never had the opportunity of playing with cars, with robots. I always need to play, have to play with uh, plates or, or dolls. That was the rule in my house. My parents didn't let me. And then, uh, another case is a woman of 35 years old that is a researcher. She wants to be a mom, but her uh, supervisor of, P of the PhD told her, don't get pregnant. It's the worst mistake of a young research. So it's, it's a big challenge. And it happened in 2015. Then another comment is uh, many girls doing the work of their boss. Uh, having a better profile, academic profile, than the boss, but being not able of being a boss, because only men can be a boss. It is happening in 2018. Um, this is a, a picture of me when I was young, and I remark here that the support of my family was very important. Uh, they never re restrict me to play with boy toys. It's true, they give me dolls, they give my brother cars or robots or they, I, we just play indifferently of what was uh, from who. And I grow with uh, six other men cousins, so I never had problems with this. They never told me, no, don't do it. I always was uh, experiment with this. Another important thing was my mom. She inspired me. She had me when she was 19 years old. She was young. She was in her first undergraduate uh, year. Obviously, she took 10 years to finish her undergraduate. She was working and uh, studying at the same time. I saw her uh, transform from a young woman that was very dependent from my dad to a very independent and a strong woman, to a woman that take decisions of do what she really wants. And it inspired me. And then I can see my grandmom that she was very lovely but she has this traditional mind of 
uh, go and do everything for my granddad, uh, bringing the food to the table, don't letting him uh, wash place, don't letting him do any anything. And But my mom with my brother and me always was the same. We have to just share responsibilities, and it was good for me. And then... Another educational influence when I was in, in primary school, my teacher uh, just discouraged me because I was another girl bad in math. Just I had to think and I just started to think that yes, I was bad in math and there was no way to get better. And this is my mom and this is my family when my dad uh, was alive. And another, when I grow up, I have in ninth grade, a teacher, and she inspired me to love math. She was a good educator, and she challenged us. She said, you can do it, you can learn it, you have to sacrifice time. And I really enjoy math, and I learned that I wanted to be an a engineer, and my parents support me, support my decision. And I study chemical engineer in the University of San Carlos of Guatemala, and then I got a, a scholarship from Fundación Carolina to make my master and PhD in nanotechnology. So when I went to Spain, I found good and bad experience. Um, the first week that I was in the, in the university, my advisor told me, you will not be able of doing it because you are a chemical engineer and this uh, PhD is for organic synthetic molecules. You don't have any knowledge about uh, organic uh, chemistry and you will not do it. Now he called me like one of his best as a PhD students. But just this encouraged me to do it. But some people can act different and can be just laid down for this comment, so we should change it. Um, then another issue that I saw in Spain with other groups that men taking advantage of their leadership with PhD students. They got closer to them and say hi in the lower back and they were just running around to try to don't phone him. So it's these things, sh why? Why is this happening in 2013? This shouldn't be happening and their experience in, in another uh, person that just uh, told to the to the managers of the students that they that they were acting like that, it's just that they couldn't finish the PhD. They just uh, uh, say without a PhD. So coming back, so nobody wanted to say anything. Uh, when I come back to Guatemala, I found that there is no too much opportunities in leadership. Uh, I have a Fulbright grant that was equity gender, so it was good. I ha had a Guatemalan Illustrious Award that was bad for my work because man started to say she doesn't deserve full time. Why is she here? She, she, sh she should be, uh, she's not working. Her husband is, uh, is the one that does research, while my husband is doing research in another kind of topics. Then the Twas uh, Young Scientist 2017 helped me with uh, five, um, $5,500 uh, that I will use to some experiments with kids. I will show you later if I have time. And I want to uh, share another personal uh, experience with my wonderful husband because we share responsibilities. He likes to cook, I wash the plates. Uh, he likes to do the clothes, I sweep the, the floor. So we share responsibilities, he supports me in my career. We don't live every day together because he's doing research in California and I do research in Guatemala and he respects it but the society doesn't respect it. They think that it's grown, but if I'm happy and he's happy, what should be grown? Looking at us only one week per month. So um, it's, uh, and then the pressure of uh, and the kids, and where are you going to have kids? Maybe now I don't want to have kids. Now in 2019, I want to, but before I didn't want to, why this pressure of these two years and a half Mary and pushing me to do what the society is expecting? So I have some, uh, this is my last uh, slide, and I just want to mention that one of the things that I, I my opinion about equity gender, uh, how to promote it, first it changed the mind. Change the mind of parents and traditional culture about these gender stereotypes. Then productive communities can, that can help us with less poverty so it can get uh, more uh, flexibility in the girls to do whatever they want and not do what they have to do to get a little bit of money. And then self-esteem and positive roles, a model of a young scientist, promote esteem since young age 
and scientific association, workshop and mentoring is important. And obviously policies and plans that are more difficult to get that maybe it's so not today in our hands. Um, thank you so much for, for your time. And I just wanna show you a fast uh, five seconds video of my niece doing some research and uh, some experiments. Oh, she, uh, she someone can help me with the volume. <laughs> okay, it, you, we cannot listen, but I want to share you what she said at the beginning. Now let's do this experiment. Hello, now we're going to do this experiment with Stella, my niece. Hi. Hi. Do you like experiments, Stella? Yeah. I want to be a scientist when I grow up like my Aunt Susie. <laughs> oh, that's so pretty. So I just wanted to share this experience because I'm going to do it with more kids in Guatemala. But it was a nice experience to hear that from her. So I think that we can inspire to our family and we can inspire to everybody around us and eventually we will be inspiring plants and different polities. Thank you. Gracias. Thank you. Uh, so now we're having Miriam Hippolyte Hippolyte, was that the way I should pronounce it? <laughs> and she's from the Université d'État de Haïti. Um. Good morning, everybody. My name is Miriam Polit. Um, I'm come from INAIT. I'm an agronomist with um, master level in agroforestry. Um, I'm a professor at State University AIT, <coughs> particular, particularly um, at the Faculty of Agronomy, um, Veterinary, and Medicine. So, <coughs> excuse me. So I, I want to to present you um, the situation um, of women in Haiti. Be, um, particularly, I, I want to 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 present. Um, um, so my my presentation will will focus on um, promoted gender equality in academia. Because uh, I'm a professor at State University, I, I know the, the situation in, in academia. Um, before, before going into the, the hurt in the, in the matter, I, I want to, I will try to, to draw um, a parallel between um, the proportion of women and men in education and in um, scientific position um, for other countries such, such as um, Canada, French, um, etc. Um, after we will we will we will see the case of Haiti. In education um, for Canada since 1884, women have represented the majority of students in master program. And in 2008, almost 47% of doctoral uh, studying in French, um, they are the same situation. So um, the, the, the number of women <coughs> is inversely proportional um, at the, to the hierarchical um, level. In French, um, we call the this situation, um, pipe perceived. I think in Spanish, so tubo perforado, um, because the 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 proportion of <laughs> the proportion the proportion 
excuse me for my accent, the proportion for uh, of women decreases um, to the to the high high less um, universal level. Um, for university professionalship, um, you you can see the the low the low percentage of women in these sectors. For productivity or scientific production, women on average published 40% to 50 fewer, fewer articles than men and in USA, but in, in Canada, the volume uh, of articles published by women represent between 17% and 18%. So um, women succeed on of which to publish it in magazine almost at cities as does where men publish it and even in better journal. However, the attic has less cities. So um, y uh, um, there are a, a lot of reasons for this situation. For I can I can I can take only some 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 gender barriers for for this situation. So <coughs> um, because um, first 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 firstly, family responsibility. Um, women generally um, are greater family responsibility than men, and um, this responsibility, this responsibilities. Um, um affect the participation in the international or national conference and in in and affect also the the visibility uh, of the world so less um because uh, women women's article are set less seat than those of men second um author Seniority. Um, uh, dans le sens que, non, excuse-moi. <laughs> Et c'est uh, auto seniority. Um, a lot of, a lot of research show the, a lot of research show the, 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 the men are, are younger, younger, younger women. So, um, um um men are generally men generally are a uh, at the boss the boss of the of the scientific council council and after women are the minority in the research work work works um you can see in the in in this 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 graph whether no matter no matter science, you can see the the, the low proportion women than than men. Okay, the case of Haiti. Um, after uh, before to to present the 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 different gender barriers in Haiti, I I want to present the socio-economic and political context in Haiti. Um, relatively low literacy rate of 62.1 percent social educational inequalities drop in common in income and lack of basic services women are poorly represented in the legislative um, we are only four women among more than 100, 100 parliamentaries so you can see the 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 test of laws uh, are mostly writing by men so about blockage uh, related to gender equality in ca in in academia in Haiti um i can take sexist educational system stereotype about the the social war um because um in Haiti, um, we consider the the woman like our wife. So, um, Asian women, 
Asian women are made to, to, ch to take care of their children and their wombs. So um, um, uh, the, the scientific field is, is very bad. <laughs> See, I can say that. So because, um, because for difficult for them f to, to drink between the, the field and, and family. After low level of education of women, um, you can see this grace in blue that, that's um, women and orange men. The la, uh, this there, you can see a low level of education, uh, no, for low proportion of women at university, you can say low, low proportion of women of education about um, this grace, this graph. Consequences, um, um, low proportion of women at university include low proportion women, low proportion of women of professor. Um, for, for example, in, in, the, in the faculty uh, uh, where I teach, um, they are we are only 16, 16 female professionals against um, 17 male professionals. So um, uh, uh, about the disgrace, you can see the proportion, the low proportion women in blue, the low proportion of women professionals in blue in disgrace. Of the 37 members of, of the university council, there are three, only three women. Um, of 11, 11 these ships, there are only four, uh, four women are uh, Ibdin, Ibdin. So four men are Ibdin by men in the deep, deep ships. So for promote, gender equality in academia, I think uh, firstly, firstly, um, must, must, must change the mentality. We'll much change the mentality, like a will our ways, renewal, renewal of tones um, by sensitization, by synthetization and by better academic or uh, education, um, and and create <laughs> a, and create also um, a association uh, of scientific and social uh, and social professional women, uh, and and promote promote inclusion of women in scientific field. Uh, Facilit facilitated access to higher position either in academia, um, administration, science, etc. And, and, and finally, obtained better, better wage. And finally, um, a Asian society is a patriarchal society with difficult socioeconomic and political context. Um, is not is not very very good for the for the young scientific or for the um, women scientific. Um, university must be the in solidarity with the creation of a community of teaching and scientific research with the full and no discriminatory discriminatory participation of Asian women. Um, a good news. <laughs> Since 2012, there we care less 30% of women in our state uh, institution. So it's it's our first step. Um, the I think the creation of space or create conference like 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 this for the promotion of gender equality is fundamental. Thank you.
Entonces, thank you, Miriam. So now we have the last of the second or third session is Johan David Reyes from the Universidad Nacional Autónoma de Honduras. Thanks. Okay, let's um, face the big elephant in the room. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, another man talking about gender equality, right? <laughs> uh, I'm going to to take my own time because I might disgrace a lot. Uh, I don't know if I said that correctly. Are you understanding? Okay, so let's begin with something. I am um, representing right now uh, Samorano University as I am a um, research associate. And let me tell you something, in Central America we have a lot of very special things. I am not being paid also. <laughs> <laughs> and not because I have a salary, it's because it's free. I am a research associate because it helps doing research. Funny, right? Uh, <laughs> where is Honduras? Do you know where it is? Uh, if you're from Central America, please don't answer. <laughs> okay, this is Honduras. Uh, we have um, the Pacific Ocean here, the Atlantic Ocean here, and we have a big lake. That's not Honduras. This is, so, um, this is not Honduras either. It's this one. So, do, do you notice that we in Central America are really, really close and have a lot of similar conditions? And I just realized that not just Central America, Latin America has a lot of very similar conditions. And it's really funny because Guatemala, Nicaragua, and well, I think that's it, can relate to this. My passport has a map on it. Costa Rica doesn't have a map, right? You have your uh, logo? Yeah, it is shield. So you can see that even when I'm not from close from here, women have the same problems and this is coming from a man. So let's get a little bit of context because context is very important. We have over nine million, um, you know, on our population, S but a very important factor on science is the poverty line. So we have 70% of all this nine million population living below the poverty line. What does this mean for science? Science is a mid to high level income career. This is a big problem as poor people cannot afford to study science careers. So there is a underlying statistic that nobody have told me where they get this, but in the university, in my alma, ma in my alma mater, they manage this statistic. One in every 1,000 child finish high school. Just one in 1,000. And of those, one, uh, one in 1,000, 100 finish a university career on time. So you see a big problem in Honduras in our universities. I will address this because in my field, it's biology, I'm an early career also, um, we don't have master's degree, none in, in any place in Honduras. Not one. One is going to open next year, and <laughs> I have mixed, we have mixed feelings. Let's just say that. So we'll face a gender bias, a, like a ponderate thing. It's, it should be easy, right? We have almost 50-50, but it's not. We don't know how this affects women, and I think we can correctly guess it affects, it affects them more. This is my alma mater. And I found this really funny. I'm using the same picture. Um, how do you call it, periodista? Journalists use this same picture all the time when there is problems 
at my university. We, in the last three years, had th a one year off because of strikes. So you can guess how Honduras is. So let me start, and I'll have to use my, my cheat here. That, well, he, I said that, I said that. <laughs> well, I want to, s to search for numbers about how um, the four main careers in science in Honduras um, were behaving with women and male students. And I found something really, really amazing. In my field of biology, 57% are women. It should sound right, right? Uh, everyone has been exposing that the majority of biology is women. Our faculty director is a woman, our teacher coordinator is a woman, and of just five PhDs, three of them are women. Sounds really good, right? It's not. And let me tell you because, uh, because of that. Biology has a big boom right now in my country. So there are more students right now in my career than graduates in that entire history of biology. And I am seeing, as a man, a big bias for men. And she won't let me li uh, lie here. I think I have this picture. Uh, I have a brilliant uh, colleague. Her name is Rosa Ramirez. I was selected for a job, and they asked me to propose to people. So I proposed her because she's way smarter than me. He's, she's a brilliant botanist. And my boss told me she cannot be with you because she's pretty. <laughs> and she's going to alter uh, the boy's feelings. And I was like, eh, she's way better than me. <laughs> like, why am I leading this? She has to be leading it, not me inviting her. Uh, it's enough to say that he said a lot of more things that I don't want to repeat. So I have found a big exception in field work. Coastal marine resource management is dominated by women. And that amazes me because this brilliant woman, like they're br in not just brilliant women, brilliant scientists, let's call them that because they deserve that. They are working very hard on science. If you search for Honduran science, coastal marine uh, resource management is the biggest production in biology. That, that is good. Not the gender bias in my career. And right here, our senior representative, back then when she studied biology, had an experience. We have a brilliant botanist called Cirilo Nelson. Um, he is a black scientist, so it's good on that field. But you can see that he selected boys as uh, his assistants because they could climb trees better than women, not because their quality or their knowledge. So that's the experience I have in biology. So now you see that this data, <coughs> um, it's quite incomplete. In chemistry, it's dominated by women. Big domination there. 76.7% uh, of all students are women. Their faculty director is a woman. Teacher coordinator is a woman. So um, I have a roommate. She is studying chemistry. So I asked her what their situation was over there. And she told me, it's fine, it's great. My majority of instructors are women also. So it's not that it's this number is lying, is that society is imposing them to just pursue chemistry. And it's really funny for me that the career in science that I found most dangerous in Honduras is a woman-driven career because they think they are medical visitors. They have to put, you know, short clothes to go seduce uh, doctors to buy pills. <laughs> so, I asked her about that, and she told me, no, women in chemistry do know the value of science in this field. That is amazing. A bad perception has approached women to a very interesting career. What I think of chemistry, the first thought is this one. 
women's first thought when they enter in, uh, in chemistry is this one. And uh, if you don't get the joke, uh, when you uh, measure how many, um, uh, yeah, you're measuring the quantity of a, a, a chemical a composition, you add um, a, sol a little drop that turns the, the chemic into a pink solution almost. In that way, you can detect how much. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Okay, she is my roommate, and she's a brilliant uh, student. She is going to graduate with cum laude next year. So in math, not a surprise, right? Faculty director, men. Teacher coordinator, men. 76.7% of students are men. This is <laughs> funny because the most condecorated in the entire field is a woman that has written the book they use to give classes. So my sister, and I'm gonna say this really quick, she's a brilliant mathematician, but she did not pursue math because society imposed her doubts. We, as her family, told her, pursue math. You have participated every single year in the math um, Olympics from my country. She is now studying history because social studies are for women. Civil engineering, I ha don't have to say anything about this, right? Dominated uh, highly, well, I got wrong this one. Dominated highly by men, faculty director, a man, teacher coordinator, a man. 24.5 of students are women. She uh, is related uh, with me, so she was a volunteer in one of the biggest uh, places for civil engineering. 80% career done, so she could go to an internship, turned down for being a woman because their CV is specified that he, it has to be a man to be a, in an internship. In the same place, she was a volunteer. <laughs> Physics, only four female teachers. Only four female teachers. 76.7 uh, uh, are men. I think I got wrong this data, actually. But the faculty director, men. Teacher coordinator, men. The general landscape, and this is important. We need to see the, vari the variables when we see things. Faculty director, two out of five for women. Teacher coordinator, two out of five for women. 48% of students are women. This is what UNA wants you to think about. Now we see the importance of context, right? These are three amazing women scientists. She is Profe Pilar. She's from America. And she did almost all the work in my field for <laughs> birds. She's amazing. Uh, she's the Dr. Lilian Ferrofino. She coordinates the botany program and now the new uh, master's degree. And I could not find uh, pictures, but the only work on orchids, a big field in botany, is done by, uh, has been done by Dora Elisa, Master Dora Elisa. And that's the only thing I can fa find of printed botany in Honduras. So everyone has different objectives, we know that. But my experience with women in field work is, this woman right here is not even from biology. And we climbed the highest point in my country, and I was the last one to get up because I'm a little chubby. So she was better and she's not even in my field. That's what I w wanted to say. So number one, yes, I have painted my hair. But uh, she's going to be with me in a project that uh, luckily got funded. Um, here I am getting very cold in a woman called Rina Diaz. That's the herbarium uh, assistant from Zamorano. She was working perfectly. And here we are in the highest point of Honduras. And I'm tired and she is just a little cold. Muito obrigado. Here are my
Well, thank you all the speakers for very interesting presentations. <laughs> and my question is, uh, in your countries, do you have government finance programs to support research? Bien, yo quiero ser corta, pero estoy muy impresionada, estoy encantada con lo que he oído. Me ha parecido excelente la idea de estas, de estas presentaciones, es lo que necesitábamos. O sea, nosotros necesitamos en América Latina unirnos, tenemos en Colombia la Red Colombiana de Mujeres Científicas adscrita a la academia y todo esto que yo he oído hoy es lo que, en lo que hemos trabajado. Tenemos ya planes a tres, a cinco años, entonces los invito a que nos unamos y a que hagamos todas juntas algo en pro de las científicas, de las mujeres en general y en particular de las científicas. Me encantó el, el evento. Muchas gracias. Pues voy a contestar en español. Eh, nosotros en Guatemala tenemos la Secretaría Nacional de Ciencia y Tecnología, también tenemos una Dirección General de Investigación en la universidad que da fondos. Eh, internacionalmente eh, hemos participado como países terceros en proyectos de la Unión Europea como Erasmus Plus o Horizonte 2020 y Eranet LAC. También tenemos la oportunidad de poder participar en TUAS, Individual Grant o Group Grant. Hemos obtenido un, un individual. También eh, tenemos la opción del Consejo Superior de Investigaciones Científicas en España. Entonces, bueno, nacionales tenemos dos y internacionales pues tenemos bastantes por ser un país en vías de desarrollo. Eh, en mi caso, fondo directamente del Estado, eh, dicen que hay, pero nunca uh -huh. nos desembolsan. Tengo un proyecto en stand-by desde el 2015 y sin embargo estamos, estamos viendo la persecución de nuestros expresidentes con más de 350 mil millones. Entonces, no están llegando. De afuera sí llegan, pero hemos, hemos sido catalogados como renta media y eso nos ha, no nos ha favorecido mucho. En Honduras la universidad tiene un fondo para investigadores. El problema es que son pedagogos y no científicos los que evalúan los proyectos. Entonces creo que es un mal que no es endémico de Honduras, pero hay que saber vender los proyectos. Entonces para hacer ciencia real uno busca becas al extranjero, Honduras tiene muchas eh, grants o small grants, para ser específico, que pueden acceder tanto gente de universidad como gente que no está adscrita. Entonces, la mayoría de la ciencia en Honduras se hace con los propios bolsillos o aplicando a becas muy pequeñas. I don't speak Spanish, do, so I don't <laughs> understand. I have a question. What is the plan for Spanish speaking research? Yeah. Where is Spanish? Government is better than Spanish. Oh, um, I, I, I want to, 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 um, in 80, um, before there are a, an issue, and scientific association. Uh, um, before there are a scientific association, um, we call NAS, a Association National Scientific. Now, um, um, for lack of budget, that it, it did not continue. So, Solo para sugerir que desde Llana, nosotros recomendemos a Llana sugerencias para los determinados países donde no se está viendo la investigación tecnológica e innovación, o sea, investigación científica, tecnológica e innovación, que tiene un rol importante en el desarrollo de cada país. Sugerirlo y que a la mujer se la considere también. O sea, nosotros a Llanas en general y Llanas a los países que hemos escuchado que realmente nos afectan bastante como eh, Latinoamérica y el Caribe.
Okay, let's continue. Next participation is from Jamaica. I call Tanisha Edwards from the University of West Indies. very pleased and grateful for the opportunity to be here. Okay. I am very pleased and grateful to be here for this opportunity to initiate a conversation <coughs> that otherwise from my sister complaining because she works in a STEM field, I never really thought about some of these issues. Right, so I'm going to represent Jamaica here, and the University of the West Indies is a, is a regional university, and uh, we are about 36,000 students, right? Um, <coughs> so the general gender enrollment in Jamaica tertiary institutions is one to two uh, for male to female. So it's much more males, um, much more females rather than males in Jamaica. And there's no faculty at all in UI Mona because we have m more campuses. No faculty has more males. And you can see these photos with a lot of um, females. And this is the STEM cohorts, gra <coughs> uh, graduating cohorts. But when you get to the Faculty of Science and Technology, there is a shift and there is now a one-to-one -one ratio of males to females. So what's happening is that all the males that are attending the university and Mona are concentrated in the STEM field and the females are dispersed among all the other faculties. Um, and, in, and that's for the undergraduates. In the postgraduate um, situation, there's a fluctuation from a one to uh, two ratio of, um, between the years. But the enrollment and the graduation rates are not in any way representative of the employment rates. And this is where we have the problem in Jamaica. But the Jamaican government have talked about this and they've tried to influence the perception of the general population. <laughs> and so you've seen in media releases where they're talking about STEM and um, encouraging the involvement of the general population, the general student population in STEM. And now, as we progress to 2018, they're talking about encouraging women to be more involved in STEM fields and now girls to consider careers, more careers in STEM fields. And so this is changing the general stereotypes in the normal homes once you're exposed to media. So now I move to my personal experiences, which starts with my, when I was a baby here. This is me and my grandma my mom, <laughs> my grandma, me again, and my son. So these should, question marks should be X's. But my grandmother, she had a very strong personality. She was 
a divorce scene in a time when that's just not acceptable. Um, and she definitely didn't want me, to want me to be a nurse. I, at one point, wanted to be a nurse, and she said, no, that's a servant role. Um, I wanted to be, by the time I started thinking about other roles, which employ a lot of Jamaicans in tourism, um, all of these, she would say, are servant roles. And so she didn't tell me what to do, but I was looking to avoid servant roles. <laughs> and so long story short, um, I wanted to be a medical doctor, but then I changed, and now I'm a geologist. So then <coughs> what allowed all of this to happen was the exposure that I got in high school. So only about 10 to 30% of girls in my high school were allowed to do STEM. And it was based on whether you had a request from your parents or you were doing good. And so all the rest were doing business and, and vocational other subjects. So here's a photo of five of us from that science class. And only three of us um, did STEM at the university level. And of that three, only two of us now work in STEM. Because even though my friend got an engineering degree from Cuba for 10 years, she has not gotten a job as an engineer in Jamaica. So this is the undergraduate experience at UWE. Only three of us as Jamaican females did geology in our year. All the rest of our class of 25 were from other regions, mostly Trinidadians, um, fueled by the oil, the petroleum industry. And there was one Jamaican male. But the general male to female ratio was one to two. Um, and so this is the three Jamaicans and one Trinidadian. So all of us have initials, first initials, starting with T and and we work together. And some of the experiences I'm going to talk about. So um, one of them, two came out of STEM. They're working in social sciences because they couldn't get or maintain permanent jobs. And so this is me straight out of university working at the Caribbean Cement Company. Um, they've resisted hiring um, geologists and female geologists for a long time. And it was very <coughs> strategic to get in. Um, I had to do my undergraduate thesis through them, and so I was working with them, working with them, then volunteering, and all of that to really get in. And then when I got in, I was cast aside to some remote location, remote quarries, which was really difficult. And then I had the opportunity to prove myself engaging in um, risky behavior. This I wouldn't do again. Um, a whole bunch of other things. And then after that, I had a volunteer opportunity to work on the seismic research vessel. And I was the only female on this research vessel. And they made no secret of telling me that this vessel wasn't designed for a woman. There's no space. There is no um, official provision. The room that you're going to be sleeping in is borrowed because we don't have anywhere to put you. But Gen overall, I didn't think, oh, I was happy to be on this <laughs> research vessel. I mean, I was going to be the um, only female admitted. And I took my photos and I disregarded everything that was going on because, of course, I wanted to make use of the opportunity. So this is my friend who did the undergraduate degree with me. And she's still working in STEM. And she's working in the public sector, um, the Ministry of Mines and Geology, and all of that. Now, I lecture at the university, and so colleagues from here, they tell me when they need people for some of these roles. And we have a big brain drain problem in Jamaica with a lot of people with technical skills migrating. And so sometimes we get these vacancies. And what happens is that they call and say, we have a position for a male. Pass this on to some males. Um, and my friend in this case is kind of accepting of this because she's like, well, yes, those roles pay more money, but 
I don't know if I really want to do that kind of work because they have to go to the mines and inspect. You might deal with male owners of the mines who might not be decent. And even the males have to carry um, guns and all of that. So, so what's happening here is that they separate the units. They have a research unit, which is where they put the females in prison, that research unit. And then they have a male unit, which at one point here, the head of it was female, and they've seen to it that no more ma uh, females enter. So when this head female was promoted, there's no more female in this unit. And there's a substantial pay difference. And they specifically say they want males only for these fields. And they don't ask, would you like to do this sort of job as a female? Um, and this is my sister who is much more aggressive and she works in the um, oil refinery. And she's fighting all the challenges. And this is, I can't go through all of it because my time is probably up. But she actually won after causing a big, big stink and getting the union involved and giving an ultimatum because they're supposed to respond to fires and this was a fire training and she was shafted and the males are going and in her field, in her lab, it's five males to one female. So if they keep putting younger males ahead of her, she'd never go and she said, well, I'm not responding. I'm not responding to any fires and I'm not going on any drills and any of that, so fire me. No. So, Yui, okay. Um, so this is the final slide. I apologize, I had so much to say. <laughs> the final slide and in Jamaica even though there's a one-to-one -one ratio in school you can have more than five to one male to female ratio in the workplace and it's very um, prohibitive thank you Tanisha now I call from the representative of Nicaragua Fania Cadira Pérez Mendoza de la Universidad Centroamericana. Buenos días. ¿Se escucha? Ok. Voy a hablar en español porque en inglés tengo la tendencia de hablar muy rápido y me quedo stuck. So, así que voy a hablar como en español. Eh, me encantan todas las presentaciones de mis colegas. He visto que han presentado muchas estadísticas. En mi caso, eh, decidí hacer esta presentación un poco más personal desde el punto de vista interno como una joven, científica, de color, eh, que trabaja en salud. Así que, para empezar, les presento a mis padres. Eh, es una pareja interracial, mi mamá es nicaragüense, mi papá es cubano, mi papá es médico, mi mamá, por motivos políticos del país, o sea, Nicaragua es un país que siempre ha estado como en inestabilidad política, entonces ella pues no, pudo, no logró terminar la universidad, pero siempre ha sido una mujer que le ha encantado eh, aprender por sí sola. Ambos me han motivado mucho a, a 
ser curiosa, siempre fue una persona curiosa. Mi papá se queja de que todavía a estas alturas, a mis 27 años, no puedo ver un botón porque tengo que tocarlo. Entonces, él, cuando yo tenía 7 años, me regaló un microscopio solar porque yo siempre preguntaba por qué, por qué, por qué, por qué, por qué. Entonces, dijo que ya estaba cansado, que me iba a dar un microscopio y con eso, pues, me ocupé mucho tiempo. Entonces, ese es mi papá con mis sobrinos. A él le encanta motivar a los niños a descubrir, a aprender. Entonces, pues, estoy muy agradecida con ellos porque nunca me pusieron una barrera de decirme, sos una niña, no puedes ensuciarte, no puedes jugar con carros, no puedes subirte a un tractor. Todo eso lo hice, me subí a árboles, jugué pelota, he hecho, pues, todo lo que he querido. Eh, siempre he tenido la influencia eh, de mujeres muy inteligentes en mi vida, eh, esta es mi, mi generación de la universidad, éramos 28 estudiantes, de esos 28, eh, dándole de la vuelta a la historia un poquito, en este caso, seis eran varones. De esos seis varones, dentro de ellos estaban los mejores alumnos. Sucedía que ellos siempre nos subestimaron a las mujeres, eh, en el caso de nuestra carrera, porque nada como que se van por las ramas o están pensando en otras tonterías y no se enfocan en lo que tienen que hacer. Increíblemente, fuimos dos mujeres, ahí estoy yo, las que nos dedicamos posteriormente a la investigación. Los demás chicos pues, se dedicaron a su vida cotidiana. Ella fue una de las profesoras más importantes en mi carrera. Ella era doctora, ya falleció era parasitóloga y siempre nos motivó a todas las mujeres de la carrera a perseguir la investigación, a nunca conformarnos, porque la mayoría de mis compañeras cuando les preguntaban ¿qué vas a hacer después de graduarte de la universidad? Eh, ellas decían, no, me voy a casar, quiero tener hijos y eso es todo. O sea, no querían, como que la vida de las científicas era muy complicada y entonces preferían quedarse en sus casas y no continuar. Ella siempre nos motivó de que todo era posible, de que se podía tener familia, que se podía eh, tener un trabajo y, y hacer todo lo que nosotros quisiéramos. Salí de la universidad y tuve la suerte de conocer muchas más mujeres empoderadas, inteligentes, eh, que me introdujeron al mundo de la bacteriología. Eh, ellas trabajan en, para el Estado, entonces... Ahí fue donde yo, yo empecé a enfrentar eh, problemas como de, no exactamente de inequidad de género, pero sí como que en Nicaragua no está muy, no se promueve mucho la investigación. Las personas no están motivadas a publicar o a investigar porque sienten que nadie les va a reconocer su trabajo o que no tiene sentido. Entonces, a pesar de que ellas son mujeres muy inteligentes, que creo que son las más capacitadas en el país para hacer diagnósticos bacteriológicos, eh, etcétera, pues ninguna de ellas ha sentido la motivación por hacer alguna publicación, por sacar alguna eh, maestría, entonces se han quedado solamente en undergraduates. Eh, luego dejé de trabajar para el Estado y tuve más suerte todavía, y encontré pues, al doctor Jorge Huete, que algunos lo conocerán, eh, un gran jefe, una persona que nos ha motivado, que él siempre nos dice, eh, no pierdan el tiempo, Todo el, siempre hay que estar leyendo, siempre hay que aprender, si usted tiene tiempo a medianoche y no tiene insomnio, lo que tiene que hacer es leer, entonces, si se fijan bien, somos mujeres todas, eh, él siempre nos ha dicho que las mujeres somos muy responsables, muy productivas y muy inteligentes, que tenemos una gran capacidad, siempre cre ha creído en nosotras, siempre nos ha motivado a seguir adelante. Una de mis compañeras, ella ya es, ma um, tiene un doctorado en ciencias marinas y ella está haciendo su doctorado en biología molecular, eh, espe especializándose como en, ba en bacteriología. Acá estoy yo en algunas capacitaciones en las que el Centro de Biología Molecular y la Academia de Ciencias nos ha ayudado a, a tener en el trabajo. Acá estoy con otras amigas científicas que encontré en ese curso de Biología Molecular. 
Y luego tengo algunos datos eh, sobre los miembros de la Academia de Ciencias. La Academia de Ciencias de Nicaragua es joven, tendrá de 6 a 7 años. En estos momentos está actualizando sus políticas de género. En el Centro de Biología Molecular, donde yo trabajo, eh, siempre trabajamos de forma conjunta. Entonces, eh, lo que están promoviendo ahora es que puedan haber dos mujeres por cada hombre en la Academia de Ciencias. Por el momento pues, hay solamente 10 mujeres, 25 hombres, pero creo que eso va a ir cambiando. Algunas de las actividades en las que hemos participado eh, ha sido en crear material audiovisual de jóvenes científicas para poder llegar a más eh, mujeres que trabajan en la ciencia y que vean que nosotros sí podemos eh, trabajar en la ciencia, que no debemos eh, estancarnos por un pequeño obstáculo o porque alguien nos dijo no puedo, no podés. Eh, también en el laboratorio donde nosotros trabajamos, algunas de las investigaciones que tenemos son dirigidas a género. Tenemos un proyecto de virus de papiloma humano dirigido a, a la situación de género en el país para ver eh, prácticamente, bueno, Nicaragua es un país machista, entonces queríamos ver cómo influía esta situación con la prevalencia del virus papiloma humano y la prevención sexual. Y luego tenemos una segunda fase que la vamos a aplicar en las mujeres de la costa atlántica, donde es mucho más complicado porque son etnias que es un poco más difícil que, que puedan como entrar la información de la prevención. Eh, y esta soy yo, <ríe> como último slide, porque mi carrera, eh, yo soy bioanalista clínico con una maestría en salud pública, pero mi carrera es para estar sentada en un laboratorio tomándoles muestras de sangre a una persona. Diría mi mamá, te crié para que estuvieras batiendo ese toda tu vida, pero <ríe> bueno, no. Aquí yo le, le, le digo mamá, Ahora voy al campo, cosa que nunca me imaginé que haría. Tomo muestras de tierra, tomo muestras de plantas, eh, de animales. ¿Quién me iba a decir a mí que el estudiar bioanálisis clínico iba a terminar haciendo esto? Nadie. Entonces, creo que todas las mujeres debemos saber y nos deben de decir desde pequeña, vos podés hacerlo, no hay nada que te pueda detener, sos capaz de todo. Y pues, gracias a eso estoy aquí. Muchas gracias a todos. Thank you, Tankia, for being in time. Our next guest is uh, Viviana Maria de Ejea Garabano, de Paraguay, de la Universidad Nacional de Asunción. Good morning. Um, I'm going to ask you if I can speak in Spanish because I think I can express myself better in my own language. Yo amo el inglés. Me hubiera gustado ser bilingüe, a lo mejor en mi próxima vida, pero de verdad que no quiero pasar el bochorno de hablar de hablar de mi vida personal en inglés. Bueno, yo quisiera como Johan a, hablar del otro gran elefante blanco en la sala, que es que honestamente nos mandaron muy escuetamente lo que querían que hablemos y yo creo que cada una lo presentó un poquito según, su, según cómo lo interpretó. 
Yo les voy a confesar que hasta el último minuto estuve agregando cosas según mis colegas estuvieron hablando, ¿verdad? Entonces, en primer lugar, me presento, soy Viviana de Gea, eh, soy de Paraguay. Una muy breve descripción, mini currículum mío, soy médica, especialista en microbiología, parasitología y enfermedades infecciosas. Eh, yo trabajo como auxiliar de la enseñanza, no soy profesora todavía de la universidad, em empecé recién en el 2016. También trabajo en el Ministerio de Salud Pública de mi país y estoy, eh, soy una investigadora asociada de un instituto privado sin fines de lucro que es el Centro para el Desarrollo de la Investigación Científica. Sí, trabajo en tres lugares, es la verdad. Bueno, antes que nada, eh, decirles que Paraguay, eh, no me salen las flechas, no sé por qué, aquí está. Esto es Paraguay, a diferencia de Uruguay, que yo sé que mucha gente a veces los confunde, son países bastante distintos, bastante, ¿verdad? Creo que hay una persona de Uruguay por aquí, lo va a poder confirmar. Si bien todos somos rioplatenses y tenemos costumbres muy similares, como el asado, el mate, ¿verdad? Tenemos bastantes cosas distintas, eh, solamente el nombre es parecido. Bueno, nosotros somos el corazón de, nos llamamos a nosotros mismos el corazón de América del Sur, ¿sí? Y a nuestra ciudad capital la llamamos madre de ciudades porque una vez que fue fundada, a partir de ahí fueron eh, los colonos a fundar otras ciudades, ¿verdad? Como un pequeño dato histórico. Bueno, yo también a última hora, ¿verdad? Decidí ponerles algunos datos eh, sobre nuestro, nuestro el, cómo está nuestra ciencia, sobre todo con respecto al género. Y fíjense que sinceramente en Paraguay, la ciencia hoy está liderada por mujeres. ¿Sí? Ustedes se, ha, se dan cuenta, sobre todo en salud, realmente es por amplia mayoría un dominio, como decía Johan, femenino. ¿verdad? Y esto incluye todas las áreas de la salud, bioquímica, medicina, todas. ¿verdad? Eh, agrarias, que parecería más un territorio masculino, también hay un, una amplia, un amplio destaque de, de las mujeres. Entonces, en general, si miramos... Hay una pequeña diferencia a favor de las, eh, de las investigadoras eh, femeninas. Les quiero explicar qué es esto. Paraguay, si bien es un país todavía cate, eh, categorizado como en vías de desarrollo, en verdad en los últimos años eh, tuvo un crecimiento económico muy marcado. ¿sí? Eh, muy marcado co en comparación con la región. Lo que hizo que... Eh, raramente nuestros políticos, que yo creo que todos tenemos el mismo problema endémico en Sudamérica, sobre todo la corrupción imperante, ¿verdad? Pero pasó así un milagro o no sé a quién atribuirle y le destinaron fondos, una impresionante cantidad de fondos a la investigación. Se, se inyectó de dinero a nuestro Consejo Nacional de Ciencias y Tecnología y este consejo creó un programa de incentivo al investigador. Ellos te premian por ser investigador, ¿sí? Y uno entonces entra en una categorización, es una especie de concurso. Sometes tu currículum completo con tus publicaciones, tus másters, tus grados, lo que sea, y ellos te categorizan. Y de acuerdo a la categorización en la que caes, te dan un incentivo anual. Como comentaba Ingrid, el problema es que no lo hacen a tiempo, o sea, no lo hacen a primero de enero de cada año. O sea, no se puede vivir de eso. Es un premio, es una bonificación. Y uno tiene que mantenerse activo porque de otra manera sale ¿no? y pierde esa, esa convocatoria. Entonces, esto que vemos aquí es las personas que están categorizadas. Evidentemente hay otros científicos que están fuera de esta categorización, pero este es un buen análisis situacional que tenemos. Eh, esto sí es todos los científicos paraguayos no solamente los que están en la categorización, eh, su producción y eh, sus artículos publicados en Scopus, 2012 al 2016. Si bien los dos primeros lugares son varones, fíjense que otros lugares bastante importantes están, eh, están mujeres, ¿verdad? O sea, hay una, amplia, hay una interesante producción científica de las mujeres y son prácticamente todas del área de la salud. Eh, yo no estoy aquí a pesar que debería estar más o menos aquí, porque eh, esto uno tiene que estar filiado eh, como paraguayo. ¿no? Yo hice, luego les voy a contar mi vida personal, pero todas mis publicaciones fueron con mi grupo español donde yo hice mi especialización. Entonces ellos no me reconocen como una científica paraguaya y de eso les voy a hablar también después. Esto es si se busca 
a través de la plataforma Web of Science, otra vez, los dos primeros varones que son brillantes, hay que darle, o sea, al que, el que es, es, no importa el que género sea, ¿verdad? estas dos personas de verdad que son brillantes y tienen una muy amplia producción. Y luego ya las mujeres otra vez aquí en lugares muy importantes. Eh, esto también es la categorización otra vez, y bueno, aquí abajo había un comentario que no se, se invisibilizó, que decía que realmente el dominio de, las, de los investigadores categorizados en este sistema que les comenté antes es femenino. Bueno, entonces ahora les voy a, a hablar de mi otro currículum, ¿verdad? ¿Quién soy yo aparte de, de mi especialidad y mi carrera y tal? Eh, como les dije, soy Viviana, tengo 35 años, estoy casada con Cristian, también de 35 años, que también es médico como yo, tiene otra especialidad. Y soy la orgullosa mamá de Sol, que es una niña de 12 años. Sol como el como Sun, ¿no? Como el Sol, como el astro rey. Y realmente ella es el Sol de, de, nuestra, de nuestro universo, ahora giramos en torno a ella. Eh, les voy a contar un poquito, creo que los colores no se ven demasiado bien, pero cómo, fue mi, cómo llegué hasta aquí. Eh, realmente un poco como decía también Fania, mi papá, o sea, mi figura eh, modelo fue mi papá, porque él fue el que siempre me dijo que no había límites. A pesar de haber estado en un país, o sea, haber nacido en un país con un régimen dictatorial, cuando yo nací en el 83 todavía estábamos en dictadura, él solo tuvo mujeres, ¿verdad? Y eh, nos decía que no teníamos límites. Límites son las estrellas. Entonces, él fue el que siempre me motivó a hacer lo que yo quisiera. En el 2004, eh, en, logro ingresar a la Facultad de Medicina de la Universidad Nacional a través de un examen de ingreso que es bastante competitivo. Sí, aquí estoy delante de nuestro hospital universitario. Dos años después, en el 2006, eh, durante la carrera, tengo a mi hija. ¿no? O sea, eh, me quedo embarazada y tengo a mi hija. Y, y bueno, ahí yo empecé a sentir lo que era realmente vivir en un país machista. ¿no? Todos me decían que deje la facultad y que me vaya a criar a mi hija, que nadie me iba a criticar por eso y que no iba a ser menos. Y yo sé que no voy a ser menos, pero me costó tantísimo ingresar. ¿Cómo lo voy a dejar? O sea, ¿qué, ¿cómo le voy a mirar a mi hija mañana diciéndole, tú naciste y yo dejé mi sueño? O sea, no podía hacerle eso a ella. Entonces... En el 2009 me, me gradué en el cuadro de honor. O sea, no perdí ni un año, no perdí ningún semestre. Mis notas fueron brillantes siempre gracias a ella. O sea, yo me sentaba a estudiar con ella en el pecho, como muchas lo habrán hecho en distintas situaciones. ¿verdad? Luego ya se me acabó más la valentía y ya no me animé a tener otro bebé porque dije yo esto no lo vuelvo a vivir en la vida. Entonces, aquí so estamos los tres, mi familia, eh, cuando fue nuestro acto de graduación. Súper orgulloso, mi marido también terminó, no se atrasó nada, me ayudó muchísimo siempre. Él no terminó en el cuadro de honor, pero allá él, ¿verdad? Eh, luego, eh, no conformes con este gran desafío de haber tenido una hija en la carrera, decidimos ir a España a estudiar, pasamos por otro examen muy competitivo, que es el examen de residencias médicas que se llama MIR. Y entonces yo también como Fania, apasionada por los bichitos pequeños, invisibles. ¿Tengo un minuto? Bueno. Entonces, les quiero contar, voy a saltar todo, ¿verdad? Eh, les quiero contar, eh, en mi experiencia, más que ser mujer, realmente hay otras cosas que, que, que son eh, desafíos, ¿verdad? El tiempo. Les dije, o sea, tengo tres trabajos. ¿Por qué? Porque hoy en día ya la mujer no se queda en la casa, no trabaja mitad de tiempo. Entonces, yo tengo que contribuir la mitad del presupuesto de los gastos del hogar. Entonces... Tiempo tengo ya mucho menos que antes. Incluso cuando solo estudiaba y tenía a mi bebé, tenía más tiempo, ¿verdad? Eh, las oportunidades ya no son las mismas. Es decir, yo me encantaría hacer un doctorado o una maestría, pero yo ya no pienso volver a mudar a mi familia de vuelta a otro país. Y en mi país no hay programas de doctorado, así como comentaba Johan, ¿verdad? No hay programas de doctorado a los que yo me pueda eh, inscribir y hacer un PHD que valga la pena. De hecho, no hay en Ciencias de la Salud. Eh, un problema que tenemos los investigadores es que tenemos que estar perdiendo nuestro tiempo en vez de pensar en buscar quién nos va a pagar lo que vamos a pensar, ¿verdad? Y eso nos roba muchísimo tiempo y creo que es por igual para mujeres y varones. La edad, como comentaban antes, yo creo que 
esto yo no sé si de verdad solo para la mujer, porque de verdad que somos nosotras las que perdemos. Digamos que invertimos más tiempo en criar a nuestros hijos independientemente, porque yo tengo una niña de 12 años ahora a la que le invierto muchísimo más tiempo que cuando era bebé, porque tiene otros problemas que me consumen más tiempo y más tiempo mental. O sea, está entrando en una edad muy difícil. Ok, se me acabó el tiempo. Bueno, entonces, solamente decirles que eh, el impacto que un científico puede hacer no es solamente el factor de impacto de las revistas. Yo me tomé casi dos años porque me metí a trabajar en salud pública y creo que la ciencia también se puede hacer desde la salud pública. Nosotros tuvimos grandes logros a nivel país en estos años y si bien no ha sido mi logro, ha sido un logro en equipo, eh, la ciencia se puede construir desde muchos lugares, ¿verdad? Lo que va cambiando, fíjense, esta es la señora, la presidenta de la Sociedad Científica del Paraguay, la primera presidenta mujer, esta institución tiene 100 años, ella es la pres primera presidenta mujer y hizo muchísimas cosas, ¿verdad? Se aliaron con otras instituciones, esta es mi hija que ganó la medalla de plata de matemáticas y luego lo dejó porque ella quiere, ¿verdad? También participó en un taller de programación, tenemos todas estas actividades acompañadas por la sociedad científica. A pesar de que yo la meto en todo esto, ella quiere ser artista y yo la voy a dejar porque es lo que ella quiere, ¿verdad? Entonces, nada más terminar con esto. Cuando yo era pequeña, ser nerd era una vergüenza, ¿no? Yo me ocultaba cuando estudiaba o me iba a clases y decía, yo no estudié nada para el examen porque no quería que me cataloguen de nerd. Sin embargo, hoy es cool ser nerd, ¿verdad? Y eso es todo. Gracias y disculpen por el pasarme de tiempo. Next uh, presenter comes from Peru, Carla González Arimborgo, de la Universidad Peruana Cayetano Heredia. Bueno, primero quisiera agradecer a todos por darme la oportunidad de estar aquí. Igual que, que mis compañeros anteriores, tuve la misma crisis existencial cuando recibí el correo y tuve dos momentos críticos. Uno cuando leí qué era lo que tenía que decir, eh, mi experiencia personal, y a veces es un poquito más difícil, cuando es un estudio, un trabajo de investigación, es fácil hablar de lo que hizo, estamos hablando de hechos concretos. Cuando uno va a hablar de una experiencia personal, se vuelve un poco más complejo. ¿Qué es correcto? ¿Qué no es correcto decir? La, per la percepción puede variar. El segundo punto crítico fue que era la penúltima. Entonces dije, probablemente voy a repetir lo que ya dijeron y además voy a tener a la audiencia un poco cansada. Entonces, eh, me tomó mucho saber que iba a hablar ahora. En el avión, viniendo para acá, tuve una epifanía después de que me desperté y empecé a escribir como loca en un cuaderno. Entonces, si a mí me dan cuerda, yo no paro de hablar nunca y tengo 10 minutos. Entonces, lo que hice fue redactar un pequeño texto al cual pretendo seguir al pie de la letra para no perderme nada y para no extenderme más. Eh, cuando me pidieron hablar acerca de las barreras de género en mi desarrollo profesional, pese a que señalaban que no se buscaba un análisis sociológico del tema, eh, como científica me fui a buscar datos, porque eso es lo que hacemos los científicos, no buscamos números, datos, cosas concretas. Pero, no, pero es importante no olvidarnos qué hay atrás de esos números, ¿no? ¿Qué, qué significan estos números que encontramos. Entonces, bueno, yo lo hice porque cuando intenté identificar desde mi perspectiva cómo las barreras de género habían influenciado en mi desarrollo profesional, pues a simple vista no, no detecté nada. 
por algo estoy aquí. ¿No? O sea, a lo largo de mi vida me he permitido hacer tantas cosas que de repente no me he dado cuenta de lo que sucedía. Entonces, cuando lo comenté con otras colegas, con contemporáneas mías o incluso con mis estudiantes, la respuesta fue la misma. Le dije, ustedes han tenido, han sentido, me han invitado a hablar de esto y la verdad no tengo idea qué voy a decir porque no, no lo he vivido. Y me dijeron, pues yo tampoco, salvo algún, alguna broma fuera de lugar acerca de tus variaciones hormonales en el ciclo menstrual o, acerca, o algún comentario incómodo acerca de, de si la falda era muy corta o los labios muy rojos, eh, no había sido nada que no hayan podido manejar y que en esencia no repercutieron en sus alcances. Entonces, ante esta respuesta pensé que una posibilidad era que no somos realmente conscientes de que estas barreras existen, puesto que vivimos en una cultura por esencia patriarcal y machista, a la cual en muchos aspectos nos hemos ido acostumbrando y hemos normalizado muchas conductas. De la breve revisión, muy breve, en realidad había tanta información que hice, me quedé con un dato que me llamó mucho la atención, que era que más del 40% de investigadoras se encontraban en Latinoamérica. Ahora, si bien si ese dato este, se desmenuzaba en especialidades más específicas, sí, no, los, 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 los números eran variables. Y vale la pena mencionar que también se hacía referencia a que en ciertas disciplinas este porcentaje era menor. Entonces pensé nuevamente a hablar de lo que me habían pedido que hable, que era de mi propia experiencia, desde un punto de vista más personal, y fue eso lo que hice. Y así decidí ser protagonista de, de este pequeño relato a la persona más importante de mi vida. Entonces, mi experiencia empieza con mi abuela. Mi abuela es una octogenaria de origen altoandino. Los que conocen, bueno, me imagino que en, en las diferentes regiones eh, las personas altoandinas siempre han tenido más difícil que las de la, las de la ciudad. Entonces, ella... Tiene ocho hijos y además de criar sus ocho hijos, me crió a mí también. Y mi abuela, como muchas mujeres de su época, no tuvo la oportunidad de acceder a la educación. Y no fue sino hasta que sus hijos estaban en la universidad que ella pudo ir al colegio y así terminó únicamente la primaria. Pese a que ella fue criada en una cultura machista, recuerdo, y estas palabras las tengo grabadas en mi mente, que me decía desde muy pequeña, Hijita, tú tienes que estudiar para que tengas un trabajo y tu propio dinero. Así, si mañana no eres feliz, te vas con tus hijos y no le tienes que aguantar nada a nadie. Y me lo repetía tantas veces que esas palabras jalaron en mi conciencia como la gota de agua en la piedra. Y hoy, más de 30 años después, agradezco infinitamente esa primera lección de vida. Mi abuela no tenía educación, no tenía idea de lo que significaban las brechas de género. Pero me dio una lección sumamente importante. ¿Por qué menciono esto? ¿Qué tiene que ver la historia de mi abuela en mi vida con la reunión a la que nos han invitado hoy día? Y me viene a la mente una frase que hace un tiempo leí. Somos las nietas de las brujas que no pudieron que no. Si nosotras todas estamos hoy día aquí y tenemos una profesión, un trabajo, un cargo, y podemos darnos el lujo de compartir esta conferencia, es por la lucha, el sacrificio de todas aquellas que vinieron antes de nosotras. Y es gracias a ellas que cuando yo leí qué tengo que decir acá, dije, hmm, no lo he vivido. Y sí, no lo he vivido porque esa lucha ya la, pelea, la pelearon de lejos muchas mujeres antes a las que debemos estar agradecidas. Entonces, somos el resultado de la lucha y el sacrificio de muchas mujeres que lograron acortar esas brechas de género, que hicieron que el día de hoy, al menos desde mi experiencia, el camino sea mucho más fácil de recorrer. Otra cosa que me hizo reflexionar cuando pensé en mi abuela como la protagonista de mi discurso fue que el mayor porcentaje de mujeres en ciencia está en Latinoamérica. Y es precisamente en Latinoamérica donde la madre de familia cumple un rol fundamental en el desarrollo de los hijos. Yo acabé el último año de mi carrera universitaria embarazada. A los 22 años, cultura machista, la niña embarazada debía casarse. A lo que mi abuela se opuso. Levantó la voz y dijo, la niña se casa solo si ella quiere, acá nadie la obliga. Una vez más fue mi heroína. Y gracias a ella, 
tiempo después no tuve que lidiar con un divorcio engorroso. E hice lo primero que me enseñó, cogí a mis hijos y me fui. Entonces, no solo en el ámbito de la ciencia, sino que en muchas otras profesiones, las mujeres tenemos dificultades para armonizar nuestro rol biológico con nuestro rol social. En mis clases de biología siempre le digo a mis alumnos que las funciones de los seres vivos son dos, sobrevivir y reproducirse. Lo curioso es que después de reproducirse se vuelve todo un reto a la supervivencia. Y nuevamente mi abuela, la familia, las mujeres de mi familia. Si bien hemos alcanzado cierta equidad de género en el ámbito profesional, con algunas leyes que sí lo permiten, eso no necesariamente ocurre en otros ámbitos de la vida, como es la crianza de los hijos y las labores del hogar. En muchos casos sigue siendo que ser exclusivo de la mujer, lo que podría llevarla a abandonar su desarrollo profesional y que en muchos casos sucede. Sin embargo, el rol de la familia, el más frecuente en la familia latinoamericana, nos permite lidiar con ambos aspectos de nuestra vida. Después de tener a mi hijo mayor con 23 años a cuestas, fue el apoyo invaluable de las mujeres de mi familia, mi abuela y mi tía, que están en la fotografía, lo que permitió desarrollarme profesionalmente y continuar mi formación académica. Ha sido gracias al sacrificio de ellas que no solo acabé la universidad, obtuve mi título, continué la maestría, después el doctorado y he podido viajar a numerosos encuentros científicos y capacitaciones y el día de hoy me puedo permitir estar aquí, es gracias a ellas. Por eso es que puedo compartir el día de hoy esta breve historia con ustedes. Entonces, si no he percibido en sobremanera en mi experiencia personal, ya no me faltan mucho, las brechas de género en mi entorno, ha sido la lucha y sacrificio de todas aquellas que vinieron antes que yo. Pero si quiero ahondar un poquito más en el tema y ser más objetiva y crítica, sí he sentido el peso de los estereotipos, que si bien no me han limitado, me ha generado situaciones incómodas, de todas maneras. Eh, si bien los hombres y las mujeres somos mm, biológicamente diferentes, socialmente debemos tener igualdad de derechos. Sin embargo, en el mundo profesional, las mujeres tenemos que lucir lo más masculinas posibles para ser respetadas y tomadas en serio. Y yo no quiero renunciar a mi feminidad y a mi esencia de mujer y, y, si, y que eso tenga que desmerecer mis capacidades y mis habilidades. Otra razón por la cual probablemente yo no he notado tanto esta brecha de género es que he tenido la, su la suerte de que mi desarrollo profesional es todo rodeada de mujeres exitosas. La rectora de mi universidad, mujer, dos periodos consecutivos, y dejó de ser rectora porque pasó a ser la presidenta de, al presidente de la, del Consejo Nacional de Ciencia y Tecnología, puesto que antes ocupaba otra mujer, la, la doctora Gisela Orjeda, acá tengo a la doctora Fabiola León Velarde. La doctora Ruchadi, miembro de la Academia Nacional de Ciencias, que hoy nos acompaña, también una mujer muy reconocida en mi país, que ha trabajado muchísimo por, por, por situaciones como las que estamos comentando ahora. Y bueno, ya para finalizar. Así me he formado rodeada de mujeres y profesionales grandiosas que han abierto y siguen abriendo camino para las mujeres de ciencias. Hemos avanzado mucho y aún hay mucho camino por recorrer para continuar reduciendo estas brechas. ¿De qué manera? Empoderando a las mujeres, contribuyendo con nuestro granito de arena como formadoras, empoderando a las niñas y jóvenes, como lo hizo mi abuela conmigo. Si nosotras tenemos la oportunidad de poder interactuar con jóvenes, con niñas, desde el laboratorio, desde las aulas o desde donde sea, con la aquella que está sentada en el, en el bus al costado tuyo, no debemos dejar de hacerlo. Gracias a mi abuela es que yo me siento una mujer que lo puede todo. Well, to put a, a golden lock to, uh, to the session and to the, um, the whole event, let's finish with uh, Sofía Balfour from the University Uh, of West Indies in Trinidad y Tobago. Hi, good day everyone. So I will just jump right in. Um, one of the United Nations key targets of the Millennium Development Goal is to promote gender equality and to empower women. 
In keeping with this theme, one of the measures that was adopted by the government of Trinidad and Tobago was to make education at the primary and secondary school levels available and free of charge to all citizens. At the tertiary level, the government of Trinidad and Tobago also introduced initiatives such as Dollar for Dollar. This, is, this was introduced in the early 2000s where the government funded 50% um, tuition and the student funded the other 50%. And then later on, this program was changed to GATE where the government funded 100% uh, tuition for all undergraduate programs. And within the last two years, um, there was the uh, GATE means test, which is uh, an initiative where the government now assesses the ability <laughs> of a household or an individual to contribute financially to the cost of education. So if a family can afford to fully fund the tuition, the government will not support in this case. My experience as a, uh, in science as a young girl started with the support of my parents and teachers, and um, both at the primary and high school levels. At the primary school levels, my teachers brought science to life by conducting experiments in the classroom which afforded all students equal opportunity. It was at the secondary level that my interest in science peaked. There, my teachers were able to bring alive the different areas of science to a level or degree that caused me um, to have, uh, that caused me to want to have a career in this field. I subsequently read for my bachelor's in chemistry with a minor in analytical, and I am now pursuing a um, PhD in food safety and quality in the Faculty of Food and Agriculture at the University of the West Indies. During my undergraduate degree in chemistry at UWE, it was there that I observed the ratio of the female to male students enrolled at the Faculty of Science and Technology. It was a two to one ratio. In conversing with my colleagues, both male and female, on the issue of the two to one ratio in favor of the female young scientists enrolled at the Faculty of Science and Technology, their responses were that the males were more interested in making money fast and enjoying life instead of studying. And this ratio at the postgraduate level continues to be at, uh, in favor of the females in that ratio of two to one. This is a graphical representation showing the comparison of female to male uh, in the undergraduate program. And here you see uh, in food and agriculture, medicine, science and technology, you have the females dominating. It's only in engineering where you have the males, more males than female. And this, this, this is uh, from a UE report, and this, the trends is the same from 2011 through 2015. Uh, in spite of the education, um, in spite of having more females in uh, education at the tertiary level, a study by Skimansky et al, 2018, in an IDB report, uh, he indicated that aggregate gender-based education and occupational segregation remain the same. It remained constant at 7.5% and 18.5% respectively for the period 1999 to 2016, despite working women educational level exceeding those of men in four Caribbean countries, the Bahamas, Tr Bar Barbados, Jamaica, and in Trinidad and Tobago. And I am guessing this probably has to do with the um, as fast as women are graduating and coming into the world of work, some are perhaps having babies and their careers are, as described yesterday, um, you have that slight down, downhill in the careers. In that study, Skimansky also reported that of the university degree holding employees in these countries, over 60% were women, but they dominated the clerical positions. And in Trinidad, we asked the question, uh, why, why do people enroll in science? Why science programs? And a study from the mid-2000s uh, from NIHUS on the public perception of science inferred that 91% of the 1595 respondents, they were of the opinion that scientific knowledge could improve one's ability to make decisions. UWE, in recognizing that there's a gender gap between the male and female intake, 
UE has introduced annually an open week of faculty research day, symposiums, and agri-expo that targets all primary and high school uh, students across the country in hope that their interest will be piqued in at least one of the disciplines. Also to promote gender, we have uh, many of our women scientists are at UE are members of CAS and INS. CAS has collaborated with NEHUS and produced a booklet of women in science, Caribbean Icons in Science 2016. And Professor ba uh, Neela Badri from UWE has been using these chapters to increase the awareness of women in science. Also to celebrate, uh, to promote gender at UWE um, for the 70th anniversary, uh, UWE intends to showcase the successes of women who have graduated from UWE between 1948 to 2017. Again, my supervisor will be recognized. Now, there are pros and cons to being a female scientist. Some of the pros would be, you know, attending conferences such as these to collaborate and to exchange expertise in the related fields, to make presentations, as well as to have papers published in peer-reviewed journals. However, and the cons, unlike my male counterparts as a female scientist at job interviews, I was asked, are you married? Do you have children? And how will your family how will family life affect your research? I do have to work as hard as my male colleagues, but will also have to deal with additional comments based on dress code. Uh, like for example, the male colleagues will say, um, if your pants are too tight or too slack, they will comment in Trinidad. And like if you're exercising and losing or ga gaining weight, they will comment on that as well. In my discussion with female, the, my female medical science peers, they indicated that the older male patients prefer to have more experienced male doctors tend to them than the young female doctors. And in discussion with my male engineer, uh, uh, engineering friends on their views about female scientists in the workplace, they had both pros and cons. They thought that the women engineers were equally knowledgeable to the male counterparts they were more meticulous than the female engineers, and they thought that the female engineers acquired more, more networking support from, for example, the subordinate, sub, sub, subordinates who were uh, readily willing to assist the female engineers in field surveys and measurements in the industrial environment, while the male engineers would have had to tend for, to themselves, for themselves. The cons, however, were that the females sometimes made decisions based on emotions. They we buckle under pressure and may cry and walk out of meetings and were less willing to go out on field work because this could extend into the late hours and the female are, are the ones who have to see about the family. In conclusion, more young female scientists are more young females are accessing science education than male than their male counterparts in Trinidad. We do need more programs in Trinidad and Tobago to promote gender equity in science, maybe such as trade fairs, car shows. Women are still not rewarded equitably for their work despite having attained higher education. A study around the mid 2000s indicated in Trinidad that women, that men having recently graduated with their bachelors were for $2,000 more than a female graduate. I don't know the current data today. Uh, we still need to prove to dominating male counterparts that we can handle family life and science simultaneously. And we have to be bold, brave, and resolute in carrying out our research. I would now like to thank the Caribbean Academy of Sciences, um, the Brazilian Academy of Sciences, the World of Academy of Sciences for Developing Countries in collaboration with IANAS, uh, Women for Science chapter, and my supervisor, Professor Neela Badri. And I will end with this quote, which says, there's no force more powerful than a woman determined to rise. Thank you very much. Now, please, I ask the... the the speakers in the last session to come 
along for questions. Bem, boa tarde. É, eu sou Sheila Aragão, da Comunicação Social, mas eu, eu acho que eu não poderia me calar num encontro tão lindo como este. E, é, relembrando o que a Concepta Margaret, que ela não gosta de, no, do nome, mas é um nome lindo, né, da, da CAPES, o que ela disse ontem, que mais do que as oportunidades que dão a nós, mulheres, tudo depende mais de nós mesmas. E, como te, hoje foi muito de, é, falado sobre a saúde, e eu sou médica e militar. E há 38 anos eu ingressei na Marinha do Brasil, quando os homens deram esta oportunidade, éramos ser, eram cerca de 50 mil homens e entraram 500 mulheres. E eles disseram para nós... Era o primeiro grupo de mulheres militares no Brasil. A continuidade do quadro feminino na Marinha dependerá de cada uma de vocês. A postura, o empenho. E nós, pouco a pouco, ao longo dos anos, saíamos, inclusive, do meio militar para pesquisas no meio universitário. Eu, por exemplo, fiz uma pesquisa da, em bacteriologia, microbiologia, da pesquisa da amebias intestinal, com financiamento do governo japonês na Universidade Federal de Pernambuco. E muitos, tive filhos, tenho até netos agora, eu tenho 61 anos, e foi uma guerra como todas daqui, acho que sentem que é, nossa vida tem dificuldades, mas depende de nós mesmas. Hoje a Marinha tem uma mulher almirante, que é da minha turma, tem mulheres ingressando, já ingressaram no, na, maior, na universidade mais antiga do Brasil, que é a Escola Naval. Há três anos, um grupo entrou como intendente. Farão este ano a viagem de ouro. Ano que vem, grupos de mulheres entram na Escola Naval com, para concorrer ao mirantado no mais, antigo, no mais antigo nível, que é o mirante de esquadra. Isso por quê? Porque as mulheres comprovaram que elas podem. Então, quero parabenizar a nossa mestre, é, Márcia Barbosa, que eu estou é, é, orgulhosa de participar desse grupo, e agradecer a minha diretora, que me deu também essa oportunidade. Parabéns a todos vocês. Obrigada. Any other question? Muchas gracias a todos por la excelente presentación que hicieron ustedes, eh, de lo que las respuestas que les pidieron en sus ponencias, así como al resto de personas que participaron el día de hoy. Tal vez yo no es una pregunta la que voy a hacer, sino que solo tal vez un comentario para decir que, pues qué bueno que las generaciones que ustedes representan ahora ya encontraron un poquito más fácil el camino y no han tenido que picar piedra como nos tocó a nosotras. Y creo que ahí no se termina, pero más sin embargo, eh, ahora tienen muchas más oportunidades que nosotros. Y creo que mientras como mujeres pensemos que, lo, que lo podemos lograr cualquier cosa que nos propongamos, vamos a seguir adelante. Muchas gracias. Una más, one more. Terminamos, gracias a todos y todas. First, I have a, an announcement. After we finish, the Yana's group have to stay for a very quick wrap-up. Okay, very quick wrap-up. I would like to finish the meeting by thanking